here. Um, this meeting is being recorded. It will be posted um, to the project's website um, afterwards as well. Um, I'm going to be calling two roles. Uh, the first roll call will be the names of committee members and alternates of committee members. After each name is called, uh, the person should unmute themselves and say here so that we can make sure their um, mics are working. Um, I will also note that um, our wonderful consultant, Kathy Sharkey, is a member of AGIS and on the regulation committee, but that for purposes of this project, AI and retrospective review, uh, she will only be participating as the project consultant. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with roll call, and we'll start with Eloise, our committee chair. Are uh, you here? <laughs> um, great. Uh, Catherine Allen? Sorry, I'm here. Great, thank you. Uh, James Ming Chen? Here, I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, Sean Ford, uh, an alternate for Dan Cohen. Good afternoon, I'm here. Great, thank you. Um, Clayton Cook? Not here yet. Um, Erica Hoff? Don't see her yet. Alice Kottmeyer, don't see her yet. Erica Litson, uh, Phil Lindenmuth. I'm here. Great, thank you. Jonathan Wiener. Jessica Bialecki. You don't see her either. She is an alternate for Marion Zoblar. Um, so if, I'll double check when those people come through. Is there anyone who's on the committee on regulation or an alternate of a member on the committee on regulation whose name I did not call? Okay, I'm going to move on to ACUS members um, that are not on the committee and alternates and the project consultants. Uh, Kathy Sharkey? I'm here, thanks. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Matt Wiener? I'm here, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Dave Rosker? Here. Thank you. Um, are there any other ACUS members who are not on the Committee on Regulation whose name I did not call? All right, seeing none, I'm going to turn it over to our Chair, Andrew Foyce, for some opening remarks. Thank you, Kaja. Welcome uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for uh, being on this call today, uh, ready to work uh, on uh, this um, important uh, recommendation on artificial intelligence. Uh, thank you particularly to our chair, Eloise, um, for um, coming back for another cycle after she did her first cycle in, in the fall. Um, it, it's, uh, it's great to see you and, th and thank you. Um, thank you to all of you again, and uh, thanks to our uh, consultant, uh, Catherine Sharkey, and to uh, Kaja and uh, Jeremy for, for their work so far on this and their ongoing work. I don't have to tell anyone that this is a very hot topic right now. You can't really turn around without uh, running into uh, somebody somewhere writing about or talking about artificial intelligence and, and how it could be put to use. It seems to be something that's really captured the um, the public's imagination as well. So um, uh, this is an important and timely uh, topic. It's also a topic uh, uh, that allows ACUS to build upon work that it's done in past recent years on the subject as well. Um, I um, uh, went to uh, chat GBT for the for the first time. Uh, in connection with this project, and I and I asked it, um, uh, can artificial intelligence be useful in federal agency um, uh, retrospective review? And in a couple of sentences, it gave me an answer. But um, my, my observations are one: it was only one page. It was it was nowhere near as in depth and thoughtful as um, as our humans, um, Kathy Sharkey, particularly. Um, has been able to uh, produce. Um, it listed a couple of models, two of which Kathy worked with and addressed, and two of which are kind of irrelevant. But its bottom line um, uh, was uh, that um, artificial intelligence can be useful 
uh, to federal agencies for um, retrospective reviews. So um, uh, if that's where you all come down, we, we have the blessing of, of chat uh, uh, GBT as well. Um, so with, with that, I'll just thank you one more time and uh, turn things over to our chair, Eloise. Thank you so much for that, Andy, and thanks for everybody for being here. I'm really happy to be here. I had a little bet with myself about how long it would take for us to mention chat GPT, and so there we go. It took about 60 seconds, so I think we're all all in sync on the importance and uh, uh, relevance of the topic. My first order of business is to read the following script to you, so I will do that, and then I will ask Kathy to introduce the report. Let me read the following script. Please note that only ACUS members, including government members, public members, senior fellows, liaison representatives, and special counsels, whether or not on the committee and their designated alternates have full speaking privileges. To avoid background noise though, I'd ask that you keep your microphone on mute and either Zoom's hand raise feature or add a comment in the chat feature if you'd like to speak. I'll then call on you and you can unmute yourself. Please then remute yourself when you're done. I'd also ask that ACUS members and their designated alternates use the webcam to facilitate conversation. With respect to attendees other than ACUS members and alternatives, participation requires the unanimous consent of the committee members. Time permitting, I'll consider calling on such attendees at appropriate points and we'll presume that committee members consent absent they're raising an objection. If any such participant would like to speak, please so indicate in the chat feature or by using Zoom's hand raise feature and wait to speak until I call on you. You can then unmute yourself and please remute yourself when you are done speaking. For all participants, please use the chat feature only to indicate that you'd like to speak or for committee members and their alternates to vote when asked. Please do not hold any sidebar discussions or put substantive comments in the chat feature. Only members of the regulation committee, including government members and their designated alternates, public members, senior fellows, liaison representatives, and special counsels have a vote. Please do not vote unless you're a member of the committee. We have a list of committee members in case you're unsure. Okay, so that was my script. I'm just gonna say now as me personally, I think that the hand raise feature is a little easier to use and just keep track of than the chat feature. So I personally have a mild preference for the hand raise feature, but I do have the chat open in case you can't find the hand raise feature, which is under the reactions button or in case it's tricky for you for some way. So I will be able to keep track on chat as well. Okay, so with that, um, I'm gonna turn to my next order of business was just to call on our wonderful consultant uh, for the project, Kathy Sharkey, to introduce the research and the report to us. Thanks, Kathy. Great, thanks, Eloise. Um, it's wonderful to uh, have this opportunity. It's challenging. I was told in five to 10 minutes to uh, summarize the high points. So maybe I'll uh, do the following. Some things that were um, deep in the footnotes that maybe um, we didn't, even though everyone who read the report carefully might not have seen a kind of uh, um, methodology and how we came to the project. So let me um, just go over that briefly. So. Um, I was involved in a um, project called um, Government by Algorithm, AI and Federal Administrative Agencies that produced a report to the chairman of ACUS in February 2020 with some fabulous um, colleagues, David Engstrom, Daniel Ho, and Tino Quaylar. And um, as part of that, and I um, commend that to your reading as well, we did um, a pretty comprehensive canvas of uses of artificial intelligence in federal administrative agencies. Um, I came into that project being very interested in any nascent uses in rulemaking. And most of the um, report is instead focused on where we found the bulk of actual use cases in enforcement, adjudication, and then some we call sort of decision-making. At the end of that report, because I was still interested in how agencies might be using these tools in rulemaking, I happened to be at a um, invite only um, presentation um, on administrative law in DC and someone from HHS presented a PowerPoint that talked about AI for deregulation and talked specifically about the use of a tool called Reg Explorer 
that was being deployed in retrospective review. Um, that was a long time ago. That was uh, probably a year and a half ago, if not longer. Um, and so quickly, the story to get to here is uh, um, I pitched this project to ACUS who approved it. And um, we began this project um, with pretty um, minimal understanding of um, what agencies might be doing. We had some, we had, um, we had some uh, empirical knowledge that I had surfaced actually in a prior law review article. Chairman Foyce, I wonder if that's why something came up on chat GPT. We're, we're in very interesting discussions about uh, how good it is at picking up things on the uh, internet. I think the internet reads my law review articles more than anyone else. Um, but I wrote a piece called AI for Retrospective Review in the Belmont Law Review, where I really used HHS's case study on Reg Explorer um, to just uh, start the conversation about this um, topic. And since then, um, ACUS um, sponsored, there's a um, consultative group uh, for a roundtable on AI and federal agencies, of which I was a member, and we actually had um, a Zoom meeting um, that allowed me to present this topic of um, trying to uncover more nascent um, agency use cases, specifically in retrospective review as kind of the beginning of searching for these uses in rulemaking more generally. Um, that was in uh, February of 2022. And from that point on, um, this project involved, first I too should give a shout out actually to three students very quickly. One is on the call, Cade Mallet is an NYU student who's jumped on board at this juncture to help with the process going forward on my end. But two students, Giancarlo Carroza and Kevin Fodoro, were um, along with me, the only ones who did the kind of field work of this, which included 48 um, Zoom interviews on balance about an hour each. We canvassed um, the appendix lists, um, all of the um, agencies whom we talked to. Um, it was really intensive. It was a lot of time that understates, I think, the fieldwork component because we also got drawn in to a really interesting pilot that GSA was doing with CMS and we were um, allowed in real time to watch lots of the um, presentations, et cetera, which are cited in footnotes as sources not available to the public. But that, um, so we put in a lot of time and I think it was necessary to find out exactly what was happening. Um, very briefly, so now just to round out the report, you know, the report starts with a very brief background on retrospective review. This is a longstanding federal administrative agency uh, practice. We have numerous prior ACUS reports. We have one of the nation's leading experts who may have arrived, Jonathan Weiner, who's a member of the committee, did a prior uh, report. But what's novel is trying to think about the ways in which agencies might use algorithm, algorithm, algorithms and AI-enabled um, tools to do this process. So in part two, I present um, four use cases. They're pretty in-depth studies um, one is the HHS Regulatory Explorer. That was the only one that I was significantly aware of before starting this project. There's another one from Department of Transportation and their reg data dashboard, uh, a study of DOD and its use of Game Changer, and then this GSA CMS pilot that I alluded to before. Um, for that, as I mentioned, we interviewed the agency officials. We also interviewed the um, industry collaborators. So as I mentioned, HHS used this tool, Reg Explorer. Um, it was developed by Deloitte, um, Game Changer. Although it was prototyped within DOD, they have done it in partnership with Booz Allen Hamilton and the GSA CMS was a partnership with Be Inform, which is a Netherlands um, software company. So what I think is exciting about the work that we did is we talked to the um, people within agencies, but we also talked to the um, developers and partners um, of those tools. So we sat in on um, various demonstrations of the tools, got to use them ourselves, got to ask various questions, got to speculate about how these things might be useful in further uses than what we're being experimented with. I should add that there were two other industry um, companies, IBM and Regulatory Group, who we spoke with um, at some length and got demonstrations of their technologies as well. So we didn't limit this only to the industry partners whose tools were being used in our um, case studies. 
Part three of the report moves to um, asking agencies with uh, agency officials within those four use case uh, studies, but beyond that, we surveyed a sampling of 16 other uh, executive branch and independent agencies, eight of whom uh, agreed to come forward and speak with us. The, they're all listed in part three. Their responses are then anonymized because that was the agreement that we made in, in conducting um, this research. So that was really edifying in terms of um, in terms of hearing both from um, the agencies that had started to experiment with some of these tools, how they thought they might be profitably used in retrospective review and rulemaking more generally, but also hearing from a whole range of other um, agencies. So that's methodologically kind of what's embodied in the report. If I could just end by saying in terms of the recommendations that the report makes um, that I would highlight, you know, the first one, which might not seem significant, but I think is very significant in this field is really just highlighting, um, you know, encouraging sharing of information and experiences among the agencies. There is an existing executive order that asked agencies to canvas AI uses and share. There's been a white paper following up. It hasn't happened. This is work that I think ACUS can do very profitably, like can highlight and share and um, encourage other agencies to take advantage of how they might uh, exploit various um, pilots. The second is really to insist on open source and interoperability. That was consistent theme. It was both part of the DOD uh, use case, part of the GSA CMS pilot. It was referred to by numerous agency officials and um, quote unquote stakeholders. I didn't mention that, but it's in our appendix. You'll see that in addition to talking to agencies and industry, we talked to um, uh, cross sampling of entities that were representing those who are either regulated or benefic regulatory beneficiaries. Um, so I think uh, I will, um, I think I'll conclude there um, and um, cede the floor uh, back to Eloise and hope that we get into a robust discussion of some of these things. And I'm happy to elaborate as people find um, helpful. Thank you so much, Kathy, for that great overview of this great project. And I am also really looking to, forward to the conversation. Um, so the main task that we have ahead of us today is to work through the recommendations um, the, with the goal being that we work through them all. And um, then we'll sort of see where we are in terms of the preamble. But before we get into the uh, nitty gritty of the line by line recommendations. I wanted to just open up the floor to see if anybody had any overview questions or comments. Okay, there will definitely be time for general comments as they emerge from the um, discussion of specific matters. So Kaja, if you wanna get the uh, recommendations up on the screen, um, I do think that we should, uh, I want to flag the title, the proposed title change as, um, one of the overarching kind of questions that we have ahead of us. So I think I'm going to flag that this question is here and see if people want to respond to this broad question. It may be that we need to come back to it after we've worked through some of the recommendations. I'm not really sure, but I want to give the opportunity um, for people to look at the proposed change and see maybe Kathy wants to talk about it or see if anybody has any questions about it. So the title of the project as approved by the council is artificial intelligence in retrospective review of agency rules. And as the project has developed, it seems that it maybe encompasses a variation of that. And so one item for consideration is, should the name of the recommendation be changed to algorithmic retrospective review of agency rules, which is what the report itself says, or algorithmic tools in retrospective review of agency rules. 
So we do have to talk about this. I'm gonna see if people wanna talk about it now. It may be that this overarching question will make more sense once we get into the recommendations themselves. But I wanna note that before we head into the recommendations to see if anybody has any initial comments, questions or observations that they wanna offer about the title change in particular. Okay, I'm scrolling through just to see if folks are seeming like they are looking for a, a button to, to raise their hand or to type something. Um, I don't see any right now. We do need to talk about this, so we'll circle back to it, but it does strike me that possibly we'll have more robust to sit, must, a remote, more robust conversation about it um, after we work through some of the tools. But I just wanna flag for you that there's this overarching question about how to characterize uh, the subject of the recommendations. Okay, so Kaja, would you mind taking us on the screen to where the recommendations begin? Thank you. Okay, so let's start talking through the first recommendation, which appears at line 40. And it says that agencies should assess whether they can use algorithmic tools, including those enabled by artificial intelligence, AI, to more efficiently, cost effectively, and accurately identify rules that are outdated or redundant, contain typographical errors or inaccurate cross-references, or might benefit from elaboration or clarification. Okay, so the floor is open and I'm looking for hands or uh, notes in the chat that you'd prefer to be called on that way. Okay, <laughs> I see none. Um, so I will just note that there are, you know, a bunch of um, values that are identified at line 41, efficiently, cost-effectively, accurately. Um, there are a bunch of moments of when we are thinking about suggesting that agencies use retrospective rulemaking when they're outdated or redundant typos or cross-references that are bad or might benefit from elaboration or clarification. So I'm just going to call those out specifically just to make sure people are comfortable with the set of values or have, any, have no questions about those and are comfortable with the circumstances in which we're suggesting that agencies consider. James? Hi. Um, just quickly uh, to let you know my own background, I actually uh, have a degree in data science that I acquired during the pandemic. And um, this is extremely interesting to me. I would say that, uh, and I, I'm just trying to anticipate an issue here. Uh, the one single biggest thing about algorithmic tools that uh, in my own research is that quite often their uh, recommendations, their results, um, and this is everything from um, you know, computer vision, right, uh, facial recognition, uh, to um, many textual applications like ChatGPT, there's no explanation. And a single thing that law has to say about these um, methods is that if you can just get agencies or other lawmakers to explain, why did I get this result? Um, I think that's more useful than simply saying you have a type one or a type two search error, right? Uh, why it was that I was classified as a suspect when really the only thing was that my skin color wasn't well represented in the uh, training set, right? It might be um, ultimately very, very, very helpful. Uh, and I can only see the first four recommendations here. Uh, so you may already have anticipated this. Um, but maybe at least mentioning the idea of uh, explainable AI. Um, and that's going to take a while. Uh, Europe has been working on this for quite a few years, and no one's really satisfied with it. The United States has barely begun thinking about it. Um, but just a just kind of a, an overarching 
suggestion and, and an invitation, by the way, if you want to get in touch with me. And if this is a subject for, for further ACUS work, I'd love to get involved because um, I do think I have a little bit um, of a background as someone with a degree in the area and some practice experience. Um, but anyway, I think explainability, if I had to put it all down in one single sentence, would be, can we get agencies of the United States government to be on the leading vanguard of explainable AI, that when people come to them or they make decisions based on AI, that you're at least given a reason. And that seems to be the single biggest objection in the broader universe of legal applications of artificial intelligence. I'll lower my hand and mute myself now. Thanks so much, James, for that. It's really, well, first, congratulations on completing that degree during the pandemic. Wow. Um, and it's great to have you here on the committee with those voices, um, voicing those views. I mean, Kathy, do you want to respond to the explainability suggestion and sort of offer a view on whether that's something that maybe should be incorporated into this first recommendation, whether you think it appears in some subsequent recommendation, whether you think maybe it should be a standalone recommendation, or if you have some any other thoughts on how to respond to the um, suggestion that we say more about explainable AI. Yeah, so first is um, I uh, agree with the thrust, James, of what um, you're saying. If I could just say by way of background, I mean, um, to go back to um, Chairman Foy said, you know, artificial intelligence is on everyone's mind. I sit on, you know, I'm invited to numerous panels, including most recently, Kate and I were just at one where there were European members talking about their approach to AI versus the US legislative approach. In my opinion, there's actually remarkably little attention given to governmental uses of AI. There's a lot of attention given to governmental uses outside of, I should say, certain very high profile ones, like in the um, in criminal justice systems, in surveillance, some of the things, um, James, that you uh, that you mentioned. So on the one hand, um, I think there's a challenge in terms of us kind of defining um, uh, a sort of a, a, a scope of a project that's looking at uses in retrospective review in which, and I'll talk to you about some empirical things that we uncovered, it was a little, it was um, very, I thought, fruitful to try to engage agency officials and outside stakeholders on what explainability meant in that specific context, as opposed to say, explainability where you're denying someone a benefit or explainability where you're targeting them for criminal law enforcement purposes, because I think it can mean very different things. So the first point is just to say, yes, it is um, It is an important you know, concept. The recommendations here, I'd want to think about it a little bit more, sort of start to get at that with regard to a kind of transparency and um, letting the public know about use of the tools. Um, so in our, in the use case studies that we represent, I would say that we would not hold out the um, regulatory cleanup initiative, HHS's final rule, where they didn't disclose use of the tool. And then in a later rulemaking where they said it was used, they then said it was proprietary technology. So they weren't going to discuss it. That would sort of be on the spectrum of what we would not be encouraging agencies. And so the recommendations that really center based on the DOD experimentation, based on the GSA CMS that really emphasize the open source and the allowing, you know, DOD has their um, code up on GitHub, they invite others in to collaborate, et cetera. Only that, those are precursors in my opinion towards being able to study, and I agree with you, James, we're, we're sort of at the beginning of explainable AI. So I'm not, so while I think it's a really important point and we should think as we go through how it might shape some of the recommendations, I would be hesitant to sort of, on the basis of the research that we did, come out and say, you know, the US should be at the forefront of explainable AI um, writ large. I should also say the report, I think, gives a really interesting um, example. So the Reg Explorer 
where HHS was using this technology to do just this, to identify rules that were outdated, redundant, et cetera. They then gave the fruits of that to subject matter experts. And there's some commentary in the report from both FDA and CMS, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, as to how they thought it was a good first step, but there were various issues. They would not have wanted this to have been just fully automated. And um, there's another way in which, you know, there's a pilot, the GSA CMS pilot was kind of a canned experiment. It was looking at a, a subset of regulations that had to do with medical devices and ox getting particular oxygen subsidies. So CMS already knew about various redundancies, conflicts, and kind of gave it over in this pilot to see if with their new technology, Be Informed would sort of discover what they already knew. Those kinds of things I think are very helpful um, but it's kind of um, explainability, James, at like a retail level, I, I guess that's what I would say. If I may really quickly um, kind of make a couple of quick suggestions, and maybe this is this kind of thing that ought to be teed up for a future ACUS project. I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, just read your, uh, the four recommendations I can see on the screen that, you know, the direction here is different, and that's fine. And I think if uh, uh, we wind up um, setting a path, I would love to contribute to a, uh, a future project on explainability itself. But to emphasize your final point about retail, um, it's exactly right, right? The most useful thing is just to pick a very homey traditional example. When you're denied or you're given a negative outcome in credit, right? Uh, I think existing consumer laws, um, you know, the uh, uh, Truth in Lending Act, for instance, you're essentially entitled to an explanation of the very primitive logistic regression model by which you know you're 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 put on the negative side of a uh, of a zero one uh, algorithm that tells you whether you get a credit card or the loan. So, if we can e extrapolate that from that, generalize to the things that agencies do. Uh, and just focus on the retail experience, as it were. Um, and that could be a, um, a first step toward a very, very big subject. Um, so I appreciate that. I'll go ahead and uh, mute and withdraw so other people can contribute to the conversation. Thank you. That's great. And that back and forth is really great too. I think I'm going to note at this point that it's possible we can revisit the question of explainability in five, which Kaja just took us to, and maybe even seven, if people end up thinking that that is a good direction to go in. So maybe can we just make a note, Kaja, to come back and think about whether five and seven have opportunities for explainability with, given the back and forth that we have just heard? So that's one thing that I wanted to um, note, and then I'm going to let Kaja type for saying the second thing. Okay, thank you. So Kaja, I just wondered whether you had anything else that you wanted to add about one and going for the recommendation on one, because I think we do need to work through these in order. So um, if you have anything that you want to add about the recommendation in one, then we should do it. And then hearing nothing else from the floor, maybe we'll move to the second one. Because I think my take from the back and forth that we've just had is that it's a really important topic, but maybe explainability doesn't fit into recommendation one. And I'm not hearing any other thoughts about recommendation one. I so think that's right. I think you, um, yeah, pointing us down to five and seven, I think were my my okay. thoughts as well. I, I think the only thing that I would add, and this goes back to the title changes, um, you know, we really highlight algorithmic tools, which might not have the same explainability issues that um, AI in general have. Um, algorithmic tools usually have a static uh, input and output um, process, I think. So that's, I would just wanted to raise that for concern. And that's a reason why we were proposing the title change as well. Okay. Thanks so much for that. So I see Sean's hand. So I'll call on Sean. Hi, I'm Sean Ford. I'm, I'm standing in for Dan Cohen from the Department of Transportation. And uh, we have one of the the, the use uh, case studies here, um, which uh, gets, I think, to your, your question, Eloise, about the 
whether we should be expanding this to include algorithms generally, because that that is very much an algorithmic tool that is not using AI. I don't think in any sense that folks tend to mean AI. Um, I wonder if we should be defining AI here, if we're, mm. uh, but, uh, but perhaps we don't need to in part because I think a lot of these recommendations are really more on the algorithmic side of things, uh, which is, as Kaja just, just pointed out, tend to be explainable. We, we can point to what exactly our other algorithm is looking for, how it's looking for it, and why something may have been flagged for potential follow-up and, and you know, as a target for retrospective review. Thanks for that. So I think I hear the suggestion that maybe we want a definition in 40, in line 40, of what we mean by algorithmic tools. So if it says including those enabled, do we want something that says such as that might precede it? Do people have views on this? Kathy? Uh, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> there are various existing definitions. So I would just be cautious, you know, there is an ACUS yeah. um, statement on agency use of artificial intelligence that um, mentions that there's no universally accepted definition and talks about some differing ones. And I kind of took that same approach in the report. So you'll see in the footnotes, there's like a definition of, um, artificial intelligence from the National AI Act, et cetera. In my opinion, it's uh, it's becoming perplexing, particularly to various um, groups, both you know within government, but but also outside of government who are very interested in this to um, wonder why governmental bodies are using, you know, very broad but different definitions. So I guess I that's just a cautionary note. Um, I, if I can, I had raised my hand too, though. I One, just point to follow up on what Sean said with regard to DOT. That's obviously absolutely correct. And we feature it here um, on purpose because it's using, um, it's using algorithmic tools and it's also using a technology that some others have used with AI enablement of the tools and the report comes back at page 50 in one of the report's recommendations to talk about um, how agencies might consider more structured rules um, because DOT, I was very impressed by speaking with the officials therein as to the idea that they have very structured rules. They know which industries their rules affect. So they don't need to use AI enabled technologies to be mapping you know, what's the subject matter, the subtopic, who's affected by it, how are these things overlapping, et cetera. So I think they present um, a very nice use case example um, that we shouldn't be thinking about this or suggest to agencies that AI is sort of this new magic bullet and it's this roving thing going around looking for problems to solve. Instead, the idea is to look at retrospective review and some pain points in that process. It's an incredibly, maybe I should have said at the outset, I think most people know it's an incredibly labor intensive, painstaking process. And for many agencies that don't have such structured rules, the use of algorithms or these technologies would really help solve an existing problem. Thanks for that, Kathy. I am noticing how many times you referred to the report in this, in your response. And I'm wondering whether, since the recommendation is supposed to stand on its own, whether some of the definitional stuff that you just described may be valuable to be here nonetheless, notwithstanding even the lack of definition. So I don't know, I mean, the lack of sort of unified view on this. I don't know, it would be great to hear from you again, Kathy, about that more limited point or Sean or or somebody else on this point. Um, I'll, I'll just say, uh, Kathy, that makes a lot of sense to me why you uh, avoided defining AI. And I think that people use the term differently. Um, and perhaps we do not, by, by, by making sure our recommendations are really uh, targeted at, you know, use of sort of algorithmic tools, that may include AI, we can avoid the definition 
um, because we're not limiting our recommendations to the use of AI, which, which honestly sounds quite prudent at this stage where we are much further along with using our algorithmic tools that are not AI. Okay, so I think I hear that we're fine with not including more in recommendation one about capturing the universe that we're talking about. Okay, so um, if anybody if, if anybody else wants to speak on recommendation one, um, please put your hand up now or or put put a note in the chat if you um, want to do that instead. And I will gladly call on you. And if not, then I think we'll move to recommendation two. So seeing no hands, I think let's move to recommendation two. Thanks, Kaja. If you could just scroll like a tiny bit. Okay, I will uh, not read this whole three sentence thing out loud, but I will give a moment for people to take a look at it. And then I invite hands or chat, raise hands. Okay, I'm looking for hands. Okay, I will just note, and I'll, then I'll ask a question that the recommendation is full of they will, they should consider and is not full of they should do. And I'm just making sure that people note that and feel comfortable with that, right? Like if, if there is like the last line, for example, if there's no such tool, agencies should consider whether they have sufficient in-house expertise and capacity to develop an adequate tool. Nothing follows that saying, if they determine they do not have sufficient in-house, you know, they should develop it. Is that, is that, are people fine keeping this kind of assessment of capacity in the land of the should consider? Okay, hearing no concerns on that particular question and assuming then agreement with the both the should consider language and the items that we're asking people to consider doing. I'm speaking intentionally slowly as I scroll my Zoom room to look around to encourage the hand raising that sometimes happens a little belatedly, but again, seeing none. Okay, I'm happy to move to recommendation three then. So agencies should ensure that personnel who use algorithmic tools to support retrospective review have adequate training on the capabilities and risks of those tools and sufficient technical expertise to make informed decisions based on the output of such tools. Comments, reactions, questions on this recommendation. Okay, one question I have that I will throw out there for consideration is in line 55 uh, that we are, so it's technical expertise to make informed decisions. Is it, is it, is it technical expertise to make informed recommendations for agency decisions? Or like who is the entity that has the technical expertise? I'm wondering, um, if if it's the technical expertise that is making the decisions or if the technical expertise is the thing that is making recommendations for further decision, just putting that out there for further discussion. Sean? Yeah, th thanks for raising that. I think that's absolutely right that, um, you know, when we're using an algorithmic tool to support retrospective review, we're not making decisions, we're not committing to final agency actions, we're starting a process where human beings will ultimately make the decision. Um, so I think it should be clear that um, I think algorithmic tools supporting retrospective review would be at the beginning of the process. 
um, regulations, of course, are then updated by notes and comments. So we consider what human beings think of our human proposals, and then we make a human final decision. Great. So then I think that uh, would lead to in line, since in line 53, it's really agency should ensure that personnel have this kind of um, expertise, then maybe line 55 should read that the personnel da, 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 have the technical expertise to make informed recommendations based on the output of such tools for further for further consideration for, further consideration. for reform or something like that. Okay. Um, An okay. Another okay. brief comment uh, would be that I think agencies should ensure um, maybe a little bit too strong because uh, we can certainly um, work toward that goal without necessarily meaning it in all cases. Okay. Do you have another verb? Encourage sounds too weak. Yeah. <laughs> Something between encourage and ensure. Okay. Uh, let me call in. Kathy, are you getting, well, let me call in James. Hi, um, this is with respect to what just got edited on uh, lines 55 and 56. Uh, it may be simpler and per, almost too broad, but I hope it, it, it's um, received uh, favorably to say, uh, should have sufficient technical expertise to interpret the output of such tools. Because the idea is that you don't necessarily make any recommendations yeah. or decisions, you simply interpret the output of those tools and that should be enough. Okay, great. Let's keep that there for a minute. And Kaja, I also realize that we need to have an ensure slash encourage so that we don't lose that recommendation. We'll circle back to it. Um, uh, okay, so let me call on Kathy now. Um, yeah, I am. Um... I'm just wondering here, so um, sort of who the personnel is also, right? There are going to be some later recommendations that we come to with regard to how this could happen at a more centralized level. So the report, for example, one of the reasons the um, GSA is interesting is they have in mind, they did this proof of concept, but since they're the shared IT providers, they may provide certain services to other agencies. And it's at least their view that the agencies wouldn't have to have the technical capacities, you know, so I, I'm, I, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit less clear, um, you know, the sufficient technical expertise. I mean, and, and I'll just say, maybe I, I want this to be helpful, but my own view, both with regard to this report that I wrote and the prior government by algorithm is that the best results are gonna have by, are, are gonna be when technologists and subject matter experts are in the room together early on while these technologies are being developed. So the GSA CMS pilot was very interesting because it had them in these lengthy calls. So the tech, those with technical expertise would be piloting, demonstrating, and obviously, you know, giving a certain level of knowledge to the agency subject matter experts. And likewise, the subject matter experts who know what they need to do uh, would be able to um, ask questions of the technology and ask for various tweaks with the technology. So this just, you know, I think there should be this, that we should be encouraging such a kind of two-way street. And I think that we wouldn't want to write something in the recommendation that suggests sort of otherwise. So Kathy, if I'm understanding you correctly, you might want to have the personnel refer not only to agency personnel, but that it might also be or rely on personnel from other, like to sort of capture GSA. That's not good, but I'm sort of wondering if it's going in that direction. That language I just offered was not good, but I'm just wondering if going in that direction is what you're talking about so that it kind of takes us out of just the one agency, right? Like the idea is that collectively there needs to be some reliance on people, on personnel with enough training, regardless of whether they're actually in your agency or whether you're relying on assistance from GSA or something. Can, is that, if that- right. It is right, and but I wouldn't wanna, I like the spirit of the recommendation, namely that we don't wanna have 
you know, we've got the technologists elsewhere and then the yeah. people within the agency. So there should be this two-way street. I'm just not sure agency personnel, it might, would, would need to have sufficient technical expertise, let's say, in either data science or artificial intelligence for this to work. That's, that's I guess. So there's, you're right. I'm, I'm nervous a little bit about personnel being, you know, uh, limited yeah. maybe to the agency, but I'm also a little bit concerned that okay. um, because that did come up, you know, there are, there's just, there's, he, as will not surprise anyone, there's heterogeneity. There are some agencies that have sufficient technical expertise and are developing these tools in-house. And there are other agencies that we spoke to who either are very small, don't have the resources, would be interested in such a tool, but they would never be able to either develop it in-house or have uh, personnel within their small agency who has sufficient technical expertise. So would it, would it capture your concern um, here to, and maybe also speak to Sean's verb question, if we have the weaker verb in line 53, agencies should encourage, but then we have a second sentence where agencies don't have blah, 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 they should consider relying on, and here I'm not really sure what this, what the substance would be, but working with. Yeah, maybe it's okay. enough, maybe it's enough just to use the weaker, just to encourage. Uh-huh, um, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. I mean, All right. maybe, I mean, I hate these, you know, ACUS is rife with where feasible. I know. So, <laughs> but it's kind of that, right? Again, okay. Can you, it. Kaja, maybe can you put a star on, on current, just like af asterisk after it, just so that we kind of have a placeholder to remember Kathy's point here. Um, Catherine, thank you for being so patient. I'll call on you next. Oh, oh. I thought I lost you. Are you? No, no I'm here. Are okay. You here? Hello, Catherine. Yes. Sorry. Um, this is more of a broader question. I guess I might just be a little confused about um, the terminology in terms of the difference between algorithmic tool, basically what an algorithmic tool is that doesn't use AI. And I guess I'm just wondering, because I think these recommendations refer to ones that don't, and I just wasn't quite sure what it means when we say sufficient technical expertise, if we're talking about a non AI algorithmic tool and similarly like in the next one, you know, where we talk about source code, would that be applicable to a non AI algorithmic tool? And I think all this probably just stems from my lack of understanding about what exactly we're referring to there, but um, it's just kind of a general question. Great, thank you for asking those questions. Um, and so Kathy, I'm gonna turn to you to respond if I may. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult one. So here's the thing, you know, uh, we would go in, and this happened in the government by algorithm, we would go in because we read publicly facing documents that an agency was utilizing AI in doing X or Y. And then we would ask to see the tool and we'd be shown, you know, like a spreadsheet that uh, <laughs> doesn't not only is like, less complicated than even doing like a logistical regression. And so we would decide, well, that's not really what we're thinking about here. So in some ways, algorithmic tools, as I understand it, the use of that is because the main focus, like what we were going into and looking at was to look at AI enabled tools. But in the course of that, we discovered, and the DOT example is probably the most uh, crisp one on this, that uh, they have something called reg data dashboard, and they've um, they use some fairly sophisticated algorithms to measure various features of their regulations, et cetera, but it's not using any kind of machine learning or AI. Most of the other tools that are being used in this space are using that to take unstructured text from regulations and map them into some kind of knowledge map, like to figure out what is that regulation about so that you're not just searching for search terms, you know, you have like a mapping and DOT, you know, didn't need that step of it. So, but I do have my own, you know, I have worries. I guess this gets back, Eloise, to your earlier question. You know, on the one hand, I was saying, let's, we don't need to give our own separate definition of AI. Um, 
calling it just algorithmic tools to include, I mean, basically um, it's including uh, techniques that are in essence doing what the AI enabled tools are doing just without the machine learning component. But algorithmic tools could be used in a very loose sense, right? My daughter who's in seventh grade does algorithms for homework and we're not talking about that here. So, but so Kathy, I think I hear you saying in direct response to Catherine that even though we're not talking about only AI, that the technical expertise point remains valid even as to the general ag algorithmic tool is that your question because that's how i that's how i understood catherine's question yeah and so kathy is your response that we do need to still retain the technical expertise point even when we're yeah talking. so i think dot yeah. okay. is a great example they've got a lot yeah. of internal technical expertise which is yeah. how they developed this algorithmic tool that's basically you know a data driven approach to analyzing regulation. So I think that would be what's, you know, these are algorithms. And so maybe, yeah, I was answering it maybe obliquely. These are algorithmic tools of a particular nature that we're interested in this report, right? They're okay. data-driven approaches to analyzing regulations to inform retrospective review or policy rulemaking. Okay. And so That's Catherine, does that, that, you need does that sort of leave you comfortable with the, the reason to retain technical expertise here or do you have a follow-up for Kathy? I think I'm still a little confused about, it sounds like in the DOT example, you're saying that there was a lot of use of computers, but it was not using a function that you would describe as AI. And so that's why you still need the technical expertise, I guess. Yeah, so um, in, I mean, it might just be helpful to refer in the report to pages 12 to uh, the top of 14, it describes that particular. So it's built on something called QuantGov, which is an open source policy analytics platform that was developed by the Mercatus Center and others who have used that QuantGov have utilized AI enabled tools. It's just that for reg data, um, which is basically creating kind of this repository of all of the regulations and then including these kinds of metrics, they were able uh, to do this without um, incorporating the machine learning algorithms that are part of um, the reg data dashboard. So they drew from an algorithmic enabled tool and tailored it for their specific uses where they didn't need that functionality. Thanks for that, Kathy. I'm gonna call on our um, ACUS colleagues now. So first, starting with Jeremy. Great, thanks, Eloise. Maybe uh, I can speak on behalf of the drafters here and just sort of explain two definitional things for the committee's consideration. And if we didn't get it quite right or to the committee's liking, uh, we can go from there. So in terms of how we used algorithmic tools versus artificial intelligence, we used algorithmic tools as a broad umbrella term uh, that would include anything from simple algorithms, just a simple set of instructions, look for X cross-references if you find them spit out some results, to things that rely on you know, more complex machine learning black box uh, learning type systems. Um, it seemed from the report that a lot of the systems lean more towards the, I don't wanna call them simple algorithmic tools, but are not necessarily machine learning black box systems. Um, hence the use of algorithmic tools um, throughout with AI established as a subset. As for three, technical expertise might not be the right term for what we were trying to get at here. Really, this was making a point about um, guarding against, setting up guardrails to protect against automation bias. The idea that people who use automated tools reflect, can reflexively rely on those tools, not realizing that there might be false positives or false negatives. So by technical expertise, we're really getting at an idea, which I believe is also in the AI Training Act, which is just when people are relying on automated decision-making tools, make sure they know that the tool might be flagging things that aren't problems and might be missing things that truly are problems. So it's just providing simple training to guard against those sorts of type one, type two errors. So Jeremy, that leads me to ask you as a drafter, whether either of these two alternatives might better capture what you're saying. So one is just simply replacing the word 
analytic or analytical with, I'm sorry, replacing the word technical with analytical or analytic? Like, is that part of what you're going for? I think that might be closer. Yeah. It wasn't okay. intended to mean uh, like, understand yeah. what the system is doing, just how you should use it. Uh, but my other question is, and this again captures, I now can't remember whose other comment it was be from before, but about the interpreting versus making informed decisions. We could also just skip that and say personnel, uh, agency should whatever verb encourage that personnel who use al algorithmic tools to support retrospective review have, and then skip to line 55, um, uh, or, or like um, retain control <laughs> over, you know, interpreting or, or continue to interpret or something like that if you're not actually requiring them to have any expertise that it's, I couldn't yeah. quite tell from what you were saying, Jeremy, whether it was really expertise you were going for or whether it was just the act of interpreting that you were going for. It's, I think the act of interpreting, just, you know, to interpret yeah. something accurately, make sure yeah. you know the capabilities and limitations of these systems. Yeah, yeah. So, so that it's really just that agencies, maybe that personnel who use algorithmic tools to support retrospective review. Oh, so we're taking out adequate I wasn't actually thinking, Kaja, that we were deleting the adequate training. I more meant if there's a one-two punch, like have adequate training, but then also in addition, have sufficient whatever. And so I was just wondering whether the second thing should be um, and retain the, not right, but sort of like retain the oversight of, you know, I'm not really sure. Okay, I, let's, let's, footnote all these, Kaja, I'm going to call on you, Sean, I'm going to call on you, and then we'll kind of figure out where we are in terms of the word, and then Jonathan, hello, um, we'll figure out where we are in terms of the, the wordsmithing of the points we want to make. So first, Kaja. Yeah, I just wanted to double check and make sure that, Catherine, did you understand Jeremy's explanation with algorithm versus AI? Catherine Toomey. Okay, uh, Catherine Allen. Um, no, I just wanted to make sure I was going to explain an algorithm to be like, you know, an Excel macro, for example, is an algorithm. Um, but Jeremy basically addressed everything I wanted to. So thank you. Okay, great. I see a thumbs up from Catherine. Thank you. Alan, Catherine Allen. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, Sean. Um, just wanted to say that I think technical analytical expertise may may not be exactly right. Um, yeah. If, if I'm thinking about the DOT tool and how this would work with, with sort of getting us to, to using that tool as, as fairly and well as possible, it would be about thinking about the criteria that the tool's using, uh, whether that's the right criteria. These, these are kind of like big questions that perhaps are maybe policy questions that might change depending on leadership. Um, it's not exactly like technical expertise. So if you look at the criteria that the that the reg uh, data tool uses in the report, I think it's on page 13. It's looking at a count of the words like shall and must, simple word count, um, complexity of the of the language, and the date of the last update. I think you know the the first two, oh, well, really all of them except for that last criteria. Um, seem like they may flag more recent regulations as opposed to old regulations um, because we tend to uh, have more we, we, our regulations grow over time as we determine appropriate carve outs and determine in enforcement cases like what how much more specific we may have to be um, and it's not necessarily clear to me that those are all flags that that would lead you to want to review the rule but i think i think they're flags for potentially burdensome regulations, which maybe do warrant uh, more frequent retrospective review, but they could also just be flagging well-written, um, loophole-free <laughs> regulations. Okay, so from that perspective, it was more like the second alternative I was offering Jeremy, Jeremy, because it's not really that we were talking about expertise. It's like that the second point in line fifty-five would be, and that personnel, you know, retain. Or, or that personnel carefully assess the output for further consideration or something like that. Does that something like that better capture what you're talking about? I, I, I think so. Um, you know, I think adequate training would be making sure you understand the tool, right, on a technical side. Um, and perhaps this belongs depth, like in a different recommendation. 
but I think you need to have a wisdom check yeah. after you on yeah. the tools output uh, to make sure it aligns with policy priorities and um, and and the agency's actual expertise in enforcing those regulations. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to observe as a macro point that I'm doing a, a lot of work translating your all excellent comments into potential words, and I also welcome you yourself from the get go translating your ex your excellent input into potential words here, so that you know, just in the interest of, of potential efficiency. Um, anyway, that having been said, Jonathan. <clears throat> thanks, and um, thanks to Kathy for this report, and to uh, thanks for um, Eloise and all for, and, and the ACA staff for hosting this. And also, sorry that I had to join late because I had a faculty meeting until 1.30, so I might have missed this, but on this um, recommendation number three, I wanted to make two comments. One is, about the word interpret, which I think is a good word here, um, but I wanted to just highlight, maybe you already discussed this, um, but there is a uh, discussion or debate going on in the academic literature about uh, AI and algorithms between what's called explainability and what's called interpretability. Maybe you already talked about that. And of course, the word interpret is something we use in law all the time. Uh, but it's also a word that's now being used for um, for AI and algorithms. For example, my Duke colleagues, Cynthia Rudin, who's a computer scientist, and Brandon Garrett, who's a law professor, have a paper that may just be in draft now, but about how interpretability is a better criterion than explainability. Uh, on the view, they argue that explainability is a kind of post hoc conjecture about what an algorithm, a black box algorithm was really doing, whereas interpretability is a more real time or a more accurate uh, uh, understanding of what the algorithm was doing. So just so that I just offer that in case the word interpret is being used for a, a more um, specific re uh, uh, meaning here or other places, but I think it's a good word to use in this recommendation number three. The other comment was about reg data. And as Sean was just mentioning, you know, there's also a debate in, in academic literature about the measures that the, or metrics that reg data uses, for example, counting the numbers of mandatory words like, or command words like shall and must. And Sean mentioned maybe that uh, overstates more recent rules that have more pages and use those words re repetitively. Um, or, or maybe for other reasons, there's also been criticism that um, if the word shall or must is used with respect to what the agency must do, it could be constraining regulation, and yet it's counted as more mandatory regulation. Uh, and so there, there are measurement issues. There's a paper by Joe Aldi at Harvard and some others. So I think we should be careful about, um, and I guess this recommendation does not, um, explicitly uh, endorse any particular metric. So just wanted to flag that, that there is a debate about that as well. So are you comfortable then, Jonathan? Thank you for sharing all that. Um, are you comfortable with the kind of gestures that we have here as being, um, I mean, we haven't actually finalized anything in, in yeah. recommendation three yet, but are these sort yeah. of like, I, I know you're cautioning us about this yes. stuff, so you're cautioning us. Okay, great. Yes, great. and I, and great. so perhaps my comments were superfluous, but thank you for letting no, me. No, happy, uh, happy to I have like, them. We, we did talk okay. about explainability. I, I, we, we used the word interpret here, but we didn't really have a full conversation about interpretability. So thanks for that. Um, Kathy, do you want to respond here? And I guess I am just starting to pay attention to the fact that it's 212 and we kind of want to take a break in maybe 15 minutes or so. And it would be great if we could at least have wrapped up kind of where we are now and maybe even have have gesture towards another one. So yeah, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to, and I don't, I don't want I, I wanted to do maybe two things. So first I entirely agree with what Jonathan just said. And in a brief way, footnote 73 of the report responds to that. So Carrie Coglanisi, myself, others have written about the particular metrics. And it's absolutely right that the report nor should any of our recommendations be endorsing any particular, you know, methodology, et cetera. The point is to, you know, DOT to its credit is extremely transparent about saying what those metrics are in terms of its experimentation, et cetera. So 
Um, the second just data point is the report on page 28 gives a really concrete, I think, nice example. I alluded to this before, but I think it's now what we're talking about, which is that CMS and FDA officials were given the output. They were given huge lists of the regulations that were flagged by the Reg Explorer tool. And, you know, I'd say they were sort of medium on. They flagged some false positives. They said this list was really long, blah, blah, blah. So it's, I think that the point that we would want to make here that seems like a good example of they're using their subject matter expertise to do a check on this. And they have to, you know, they have to have maybe some kind of understanding of the tool, but um, but certainly not, um, you know, and it would be it would be better in this instance if they had known, you know, what were the metrics leading to the flagging, et cetera. So uh, I, I think that that is supported, in other words, that the that we need, I, I don't know about personnel. I mean, I, I like using subject matter experts, the agencies themselves talk about SMEs all the time. I don't, I don't know how you all feel about that terminology, but. Um. Okay, so here's, here's my current recommendation <laughs> to how to handle kind of everything where we are um, is that maybe what if we, keep the ensure part now that we've slightly shifted where we are. So Kaja, could you do the temporary blackout of encourage, even though I know I asked you to add the asterisk there in a minute, a minute ago. Um, and that we maybe also temporarily, Kaja, brack out the stuff, uh, um, X out the stuff after the double bracket, because maybe I'm gonna float whether assess the output for further consideration captures everything that we've been talking about, notwithstanding our just our observation about the word interpret that we had a moment ago. So I am gonna offer this as the kind of capturing of where we have. Maybe I'm gonna do a quick follow-up, Kathy, subject matter experts, or you know, however you want to do that phrase, would that capture both the the training point and the assess point. So we want to just rename personnel in line 53, or do we want to, is it is it more to the second one in line 55? It was more to the second one. I mean, I think I'm back to, I think I like encourage more than ensure. Like I'm thinking again about small agencies okay. who yeah. you know, aren't going to have internal technical experts, but they would have subject matter experts who inherent in two is sort of the idea that they should probably be told something about how this tool works, et cetera. Right. But what about, I thought the point was that if they are having their own in-house people to use the tools, they should ensure that they have sufficient training, right? I thought your concern from two was that we can't have them, we can't have, we can't burden small agencies with having sufficient personnel if they don't. Right. Yeah, sorry, I missed the thread of, I mean, I want to, I'm thinking about both sets, what agencies who are developing this in-house and those who would not be, right? This is addressing all agencies, correct? Yes. So my question was just in line 53, we're talking about personnel, we're talking about if you're using algorithmic tools, you should ensure that they have the adequate training. Whereas I thought you were saying, if we are, if they're, we're not making them all have the adequate. I've lost the thread because I, I, can right. you just? I'm, I'm thinking here's a specific example. There were agencies we specifically talked to who were very eager to learn from the DoD's game changer and said specifically, "Wow, if we could take that tool and tailor it to our uses, that would be great." But we're tiny and we're not gonna have the people in house, et cetera. And then we had agencies like GSA saying, there's no need that each agency right, right. have to have that expertise. But isn't the point that if they're using them inside the agency, they have to have, if, if the people who are using them inside the agency, they should have the appropriate personnel. That's at least the way I'm reading. They should have the training. If you're doing it in house, you should make sure your people have the appropriate training. If you're not doing it in house, whatever. So I think encourage goes more to what we said in two, whereas once you're doing it in-house, you should ensure. Uh, 
Um, okay. I'm just going to, sorry, Eloise, I'm just going to ju jump in real quick and just say that like we um, phrased this so that personnel meant like the regulatory decision makers. So whoever's making the decision based off of an algorithm has training on the algorithm so that they know exactly like what Jeremy had said, not to have any type of automation bias. I hope that's clarifying. <laughs> Well, but then it answers my, it answers Kathy's question. Kathy, um, can I, okay, one meta comment. Can we not use the chat for all of the subject matter stuff that's floating in? I would totally welcome <laughs> all of this, but I think it's, it's the chat is that I read at the ACUS thing in the beginning is supposed to be just for like, do you want to raise your hand in? So um, I would be just grateful if, if we could uh, following the ACUS protocol that I was asked to follow, if we could save the chat for, Hey, Eloise, please call on me. Um, uh, though I actually am totally intrigued by everything that everybody is saying in there. So there's not a, a diss on any of the great material people are putting there, just sort of an ACUS protocol point. Let's save the chat for please call on me. Um, I thought that uh, in, in response to, um, to where we are in recommendation three, that, uh, that Kathy had just suggested that the subject matter personnel, she was really concerned about capturing that at line 55, but not at line 53. But Kaja, now I hear you saying that at line 53, you also meant regulatory sort of decision makers and not just. Yeah, I don't think this one, this recommendation we didn't contemplate as including the technical folks at all. Um, I would imagine that maybe some of that transparency and training issues are probably raised in a lower or, or could better be raised in a lower recommendation. Okay, well, but then I'm wondering if use is the right verb <laughs> because are the regulatory decision makers using the tools or are they reviewing the output of the tools? I would imagine they do both. You could say use information obtained from the algorithmic tools, then it's probably agnostic at that point, right? At a certain point, it's just, whether they are themselves using the tool, they are receiving information from the tool and seeking to interpret it for regulatory purposes. So that might be an easier way to frame it. Okay, but then from that perspective, then subject matter expert still is captured at at the first personnel point, not just the second personnel point. Okay, so Kathy, what was the term of art you were using? SME, is that yeah, a phrase that you're asking? Expert. Are you actually suggesting that we use that phrase here? Or are you, like Kaja was just offering us, Kaja, what was the word you used? Regulatory personnel? Regulatory decision makers. Regulatory decision makers. I am agnostic on this point, but we should have something on the screen that captures what it is we're trying to talk about. Regulatory decision makers may capture Kathy's point in a more generalized way. So maybe we want to say that, regulatory decision makers. Yeah, I'd well, I'm sorry, I should raise my hand. Kathy, I call on you. Yeah, I I, I don't have a, a strong view. If there are government folks who want to weigh in, it was um, SMEs was used consistently by those whom we interviewed when they talked about this interface with. But it may, you know, I think in the report I went through and took out SME and, and made it subject matter expert, subject matter expert, because not every reader knows yeah. SME. So regulatory decision maker may capture that it's a, a, a I would defer to our government you know members okay so I am going to now just throw back out there again um so that we're that that we should keep the insurer so agencies should ensure that regulatory decision makers who use algorithmic tools to support retrospective review have adequate training on the capabilities and risks of those tools and and then delete that personnel because we're just talking about them again and then and keep the end and carefully assess the output for further consideration. That is my, I think that captures what we've been talking about. Um, if people uh, would like to either disagree with that general suggestion or propose individual refinements, um, please raise your hand or put in the chat that you'd like to be recognized. Um, I guess at this point though, because we've had such a fulsome discussion of the literature and the, the kind of the big conceptual points, at this point, I'm really asking for a wordsmithing. So if you raise your hand, it would be wonderful if you could contribute 
whatever your substitute point is through the lens of a inline 53, blah, 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 input. Okay, I'm scrolling through just to see if, again, it looks like people are trying to unmute or something like that. And I don't see that, and I don't see hands, and I don't see a request to be recognized in the chat. So I'm going to now just say, and then I'm going to wait a minute for somebody to raise a hand in desperate no, no. I'm going to say that I think what we have now at lines 53 through 56, including the red stuff and not including the stuff that's X'd out in 56 and 57, I think that this is capturing where we are. And so maybe we're good with it. And I knew that if I did that, that I would get a hand. So Sean, I recognize you in the sincere hope that whatever you say is going to be coupled with a please use blah, blah word at line whatever. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I really like where we're ending up. And I, I, I have a really minor point that um, I, I'm just kind of not following the structure of the sentence right now. It says agencies should ensure regulatory decision makers who use these tools have adequate training and carefully assess the output is the and for the regulatory decision makers or the agencies does, uh does I that make sense for, yeah it does make sense to me i meant it for the regulatory decision makers but i see the confusion and that they carefully assess yeah. Can I tell you that i did not add the that they because i was envisioning our friends at the plenary in june who like do all sorts of strikeouts of, you know, clarifying, but doubling up grammatical points. So I was limiting myself based on my experience of being X'd out at the plenary by uh, tight wordsmithers. But Sean, I actually hear you and almost suggested that to begin with. Does this capture what you were going to? Okay. Yes. Thanks, Sorry, Sean. but I, I don't think they does it grammatically, okay. but I propose agencies should ensure that regular decision makers, blah, 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 um, uh, one, can you do our A, have adequate training and B, carefully assess? Yeah, that all, that also is fine with me. That captures the same thing. Because they could be agencies too. Yes, that is true. And that better captures what I meant. Kaja and Jeremy, are we violating some ACUS thing? If we, okay, great. Then, then let's do the A and B as Kathy suggested. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Okay, I would have said, and I bet somebody else at the plenary would say that we need to have an open parens before A or B, but that truly is like a an ACA style and I will stand down on that. So like you do whatever it is that this committee on style is gonna do with that. Okay, so going once, I mean, I'm not gonna say- Sorry, going I would take out, okay. sorry, you gotta take out that they, that doesn't belong. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I think, um, People, are, are we good with this for now? Okay. Um, obviously this is not the only, only, only time that we will have to do this, but I think it is where we are for now. Okay, so it is 2.26. We've been at this for an hour and a half. Let's take a, but Kaja and Jeremy, can you just remind me what our default is for the break halfway through? Do we have like a five minute default or do we have a, Five minutes, is that? Five, five minutes is fine. Yeah, okay, great. So let's take a five minute break now. Let's come back around 2.31 and we'll work through the rest of the recommendations. Thanks everybody. Um, I'd love to get started, but I'm hoping to see some more <laughs> faces as perhaps there is little point in getting started if it is only Kaja, Jeremy, and me on the line. Hello, Kathy. <laughs> um, folks, if you are here, could you please uh, put your camera back on? Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. I think we're in a position to uh, to continue. Okay, um, so let's start back up at line 57 with recommendation four. 
To promote transparency and build internal expertise, agencies should, when developing or selecting an algorithmic tool to support retrospective review, ensure that the source code for the tool is publicly available and interoperable with other government systems. If agencies use an algorithmic tool that is not open source, they should ensure that key information about the tool's development, operation, and use is available to agency personnel and the public. Okay, the floor is open. Let's see some hands for um, suggestions of things to modify or tweak or change entirely. Okay, I was not necessarily expecting that this would be one that was met with great silence, uh, but it is being met <laughs> with great silence. So perhaps we have some general agreement here and we should move to line 63 for recommendation five. I guess I was just wondering whether the people who, I had suggested that maybe there's opportunities for explainability and interpretability in five, but I'm just making sure that people don't want to put anything in four that is not already there. But it sounds like people were okay with it. And so we'll move on to five. Kathy? So, you know, uh, I'll just ask a question, I think, for four. I mean, um, the report insists on open source and interoperability. So we might just want to discuss. I understand I I've, I've have a long history with ACUS, but we might just want to discuss why not insist on open source and interoperability. And it's not just me insisting, um, DOD insisted upon it, GSA and CMS insisted upon it in the, so there's support, you know, in the, um, in the report uh, for insisting upon it. Kathy, can I just make sure that I understand what your suggestion is? Are you suggesting that we talk about the importance of the use of the verb ensure here? Or are you suggesting that you want to use a verb, a different verb, insist that you take to be strong? Yeah, sorry, let me be clear. I'm asking, I mean, why not delete the second sentence? I'm just asking. Okay, all right, all right. So you're not, I, I couldn't, you kept using the word insist and I couldn't tell whether you were saying that you wanted it as stronger than ensure or whether you just wanted to observe that ensure means insist and make sure everybody's okay with that. Yeah, so um, this is an important part of the report. So let's just, you know, Sean, let's see let's see where folks are with this, Sean. Yeah, I, 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 um, I think that should is already in the recommendation. So ensure is fine because uh, there's no must there. It's clearly like a goal that's a good goal. And the second sentence is really, if you can't meet that first goal, and I'm wondering if that should be made clear. Um, so if the agency is unable or for other reasons does not select uh, an open source tool, then, then they should ensure that the key information about the tool development and operation and use is available. That, that seems to me like an important thing to include because it may be the case that an agency ultimately selects a tool that's not open source because it's efficient and already exists on the market as opposed to building, building something themselves. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Does unable capture uh, the second part of what you were saying as well? Or do you think that there's a need to say unable or for other to use or for other reasons? I mean, Again, I think it's a good ideal. I think you should, um, but th it's not necessarily the only thing that you're thinking about when you're selecting the proper tool. Yeah, no, so I perhaps hear you. unable I hear you. is not the right one because that you might you might decide to select a closed source tool that's superior in some other respects. Okay, so then you do want the second prong. So if agencies are unable, or I'm gonna lose the thread of the grammar here, but let's just say this grammatically poorly right now. If agencies are unable to select or for some other reason, 
choose not to use an uh, algorithmic. Perhaps it was just fine as if agencies use, <laughs> because that 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 just supposes the decision was made in the alternate. Yeah. Right. Okay. So so bracket that then, Kaja. Um, uh, James. Uh, very simply, if the agencies do not use an an algorithmic tool that is open source, they should, and that's that that takes all the happen. question. Of okay. If agencies do not use an algorithmic tool that is open source, they should ensure. Okay, yeah, I think that captures Sean. That certainly captures, I think, what you were going with. Um, and I'm not seeing really objections, Kathy, to your overall um, should language here. Okay, are people comfortable with this then as it reads now? Okay, Kathy? Yeah, I just, I mean, I, I, I think I heard a little bit from Sean. I personally would think that we would wanna discuss um, why an agency would not use a tool that's not open okay. source. So, so do you wanna, can you like give some, a list to Kaja that she can sort of write down as a, as a, brain flow, and then we can kind of- Well, I guess I would just, for purposes of our discussion, I mean, the report mentions at pages 47 to 49, you know, a danger that uh, there could be vendor lock-in, for example, if you use a particular tool with proprietary technology, it will not be one that, for example, you know, DOD touted, they had- Booz Allen Hamilton working on this, but it's open source. So they're not locked in with that particular vendor and it can be used elsewhere and they're able to share this tool, et cetera. So uh, I, I just would, you know, we're making recommendations. So I guess I, I don't know, or I just would like to hear more because it doesn't come sort of from the report that of why we would be uh, not just stopping. We have language they should, do this. Obviously, they can decide not to do that. So I'm not. I'm not sure why we would have that second sentence. So I just have to. I just want to raise that. Okay, Jeremy, as a drafter. Yeah, it just sounds like in this conversation that there's sort of a usual cost benefit calculus. There's obviously benefits to open source, like preventing vendor lock in. But as Sean said, there might be cost to using it. There might be a superior product that's proprietary. Agencies obviously use proprietary tools all the time. I mean. We're using Zoom right now, which is a proprietary software. So there might be good reasons in certain circumstances, I imagine, um, from an agency perspective, to use tools that are not necessarily open source. But it sounds like it's really just consider the costs and the benefits of using open source software. I don't know how that gets expressed, but it sounds from the discussion like that's what we're getting at. Sean? Yeah, the, the reason I think the second census is important is just because I think, in fact, some people will ultimately not use open source. And in that event, they should do as much as they can to provide transparency about how the tool is working, uh, even if they can't produce the source code. Uh, certainly not to diminish the report's findings. I, I do agree wholeheartedly that open source is better uh, when possible. I, I concur. I'm convinced. You're right. And as long as, you know, there's the should and then just if they do not, I agree. Okay, thanks for that, Kathy. Jeremy, is your hand up an, a fresh or an old? Okay, all right. Okay, I think then uh, uh, I'm gonna just pause for a minute to see if anybody else wants to weigh in on anything in uh, recommendation four. Again, with the request to get some language in for our consideration, if you wanna make any suggestions. And I will pause. Okay, uh, hearing none, let's move to recommendation five. Okay, so um, can I first make sure that I see, now that we've added um, at my request, the first comment in the margin about whether there are opportunities for explainability or interoperability here, I want to just ask the ACUS staff, what exactly is this um, referring to? Is this also referring to recommendation five or is this referring to something else? Sorry, the ACUS staff comment? 
Yes. What is that for? Oh, what yes. That that's, for, that's for number five. That is for number five. Okay, great. Just double checking. Okay. So I'm going to give a minute then for people to read number five. Uh, and, but please also look at the, at the two comments about whether this is a moment to say something about explainability and or interpretability. And then the ACA staff question about generally applicable policies. Okay, so I think my question is narrower and also comes from less knowledge. So maybe we can deal with that quickly because I, I don't, I truly, this is, I am not a subject, an SME in this area, Kathy. So um, is there something that, pe that needs to be said here or that should be said here about explainability or interpretability here? From the outside, I just threw this in as a potential area because we were talking about all sorts of other things that agencies should do when they're talking about their reliance or use on these tools. So maybe should we start there? Is this a moment or is this not a moment to say something about explainability or interpretability? Sean? I think it already does when it says, and if so, explain how. Okay, I was just making sure that that is all that we needed to say in the land of explainability. Um, Jonathan? Um, yeah, I'm commenting here partly because I was involved in the periodic retrospective review report and recommendation that are cited here. Um, so I think this is, uh, this is good. Uh, the, it seems that if the, um algorithmic tool is used to uh, develop evidence or uh, justification for a new rulemaking. So if there's a retrospective review that used an algorithmic tool that then becomes the basis for uh, revising the old rule in a new rulemaking, then you know the basic uh, principles of administrative law would require the um, uh, explanation of the reasons for the revision in the rule. Um, we could we could emphasize that here as well. Um, but it, maybe number five is trying to say, uh, trying to focus more on the plans for retrospective reviews and the description of a specific retrospective review, uh, irrespective of whether it's used as the basis for a new rule. Um, so in that, case, in that case, this is, it seems like this is fine, you know, disclose whether they used and if so, explain how they used algorithmic tools, but maybe there could be more uh, muscle in this, in this recommendation, you know, to explain how it, uh, the algorithmic tool uh, influenced the findings of the retrospective review as compared to not using it or something, something else. Maybe that Kathy may have a better suggestion. So Jonathan, were you talking at first, at first I took you to be saying that uh, if a new rulemaking grows out of what happens in retrospective review using an algorithm, that the new rulemaking should explain and disclose the genesis of it through this project. Is that what you were saying? Because the second thing you said yes. made me think you were not saying that. Yes, I was saying that. I think okay. then, but then I was saying perhaps recommendation five is uh, addresses a broader set, a larger set of retrospective review plans and specific retrospective reviews, um, not all of which would result in a new rulemaking. Yeah. yeah, okay. So this is then a question um, maybe for you, Jonathan, but also maybe for ACUS staff, uh, whether Jonathan's suggestion is already incorporated in some other forward-looking rulemaking such that we either can one, refer to it or two, don't need to have it here. Do you know what I mean, right? Like, does it, do we already have some recommendation that says when doing a new rulemaking, 
if the genesis of the rulemaking relied in part on some algorithmic tools, it should be disclosed. Because if not, then what Jonathan is saying is actually like it's sort of a new and important point in this recommendation. And so wondering uh, whether we should either incorporate some other thing or just flag it here. Yeah, it's it's a great point. I don't think we've addressed it anywhere. I can't imagine where we would have addressed it. So um, probably worth considering here. Okay. And so Jonathan, does this sound to you like a third sentence or does it sound to you like a, sec a separate recommend separately numbered recommendation? Um, yeah, I, either way would be fine. I think it could be a third sentence here in number five. And I liked, you know, your sentence, a, a short and simple sentence uh, would be good. Um, so something like when, what, I think you said something like when an algorithmic tool is used as the basis, I think you might've said Genesis, but I'm not sure if we. Yeah, basis is better. Yeah. I think this is third sentence, Kasia. Thank you. Uh, or maybe we need to say, because this report is about retrospective review, we need to say when a retrospective review using an algorithmic tool serves as the basis for a new rulemaking, the agency should what? explain the findings and reasoning that support the new rule, maybe that period, maybe that's too too bland. Yeah, I think don't we need it to incorporate the the algorithmic tool part of it? Should explain how the algorithmic tool led to the new or or was you know contributed to the development yeah. of the new rulemaking. I want I want to defer also to Kathy and the others who yeah. worked on this. Exactly. Know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I see Kathy's hand right there. Um, and just before I call on Kathy, Kaja, can you change it to agencies, not the agency in line 72, just to match everything else we have? Thank you. Kathy? Yes, yeah, so this is really just a question to Jonathan, because I mean, that's, I, I, I mean, that's the dictate of administrative law, if it's the substance of basis. So I wouldn't think we would, I, I see your point, but I would be cautious that ICUS recommendations don't usually states on you know like we could cite cases for that proposition and i thought that the point of this was to get at for example when hhs published their final rule on regulatory cleanup they didn't disclose at all the use of the tool because it was non-substantive etc and i thought this was encouraging kind of public disclosure of tools being used uh in a not, not when they're not the substance or basis of the new rulemaking but it's more a question. I have no objection to it, but it just, and maybe this is for the ACUS folks, right? Like we could cite administ we could cite case, like that's a that's an administrative law proposition. So I'm not John, well, maybe let's call on Jonathan first. Jonathan, was there something more specific that you were getting at here? Well, no, I mean, I, I agree with Kathy. This is kind of would would already be covered in the administrative law of the new rulemaking. What may be different here is that. Uh, the algorithmic tool may be used in a, a way that's not um, as transparent or not as um, visible. So I I've thought of this when looking at number five because number five refers to these uh, recommendation 2021-2 on periodic retrospective review, which is about statutes and executive orders which and even agencies own policies, which call on agencies to do retrospective review periodically, such as every five years or so, uh, or every two years or eight years. And, and it um, it is uh, frequently, but not always, aimed at revising a past rule, updating uh, a past rule. So recommendation five refers to that, but then uh, limits itself to how that algorithmic tool was used in the retrospective review. And so I was just thinking, well, maybe it should also uh, point to the potential use in the uh, rural revision. Um, but if, if, if you think, if Kathy or others think that 
doesn't really go here or it's um it's uh self-evident then it's not crucial um but i mean recommendation number five seems to be a kind of bare minimum uh uh say that you used if you used an algorithmic tool say that you did um, right. so I thought we could do say a little more Okay, thank you for that. And so, Kaja, are you? Do you have a response to this? More I do. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I. I think this is great to include, and I don't think it's duplicative at all. I don't think you know the APA doesn't contemplate the use of algorithmic tools, and so I think that this does expand it in a way that is a bit of a um, a safeguard in terms of transparency of agency use of these tools. So that's that's my opinion. I think it's a it's a good addition. Okay, thanks, Kaja. Phil. Yeah, hi. Um, is my is my video on? Your video is not on, but we can hear you just fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. First, first thing, I apologize, but I have to leave for three o'clock. But, but I would also respectfully disagree, um, because even if you use a tool to identify a particular rule that's either inconsistent with other rules, outdated you know, has the wrong law or needs to be amended in some way, a human being still has to make that determination. And the agency has to commit the resources to actually do the work. So whether you use artificial intelligence or some other form or mechanism to identify which regulations need to be amended or withdrawn or whatever, it's it's still a human activity. So I'm 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 really not sure that that you know recommending to agencies that oh by the way when you do this amendment um, you know you're putting your preamble well in the course of our retrospective review of the regulation we found that this needed to be changed for whatever reason and by the way we used artificial intelligence to generate that this this, this work product I, I just don't see I just don't see the point and you know why what what is that game what is that what does that tell the public? Because it doesn't tell the public why the rule needed to be changed. Okay, thank you for that. So this sounds like you're hearkening back to our earlier recommendation about the need for humans to still make the decision. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Jonathan, maybe if I could call on you, since it's your initial, initially your sentence, do you have a response to Phil's uh, concern here that it's irrelevant? Um. Of course, it's a human decision, um, at least under our current system of government. And uh, so um, I think that last sentence that we just suggested adding is also about a human decision maker. It's just saying, explain how the human decision maker used the tool or how the tool contributed to the development of the new rule. Um, <clears throat> So the idea being that the preamble would ordinarily talk about the genesis, and this is just one of the things that would be in the genesis, and since it is there, agencies shouldn't hide it. I mean, I think that's sort of what you're getting at. Kathy? Yeah, I think that we should, the spirit of what Jonathan wants, we should talk more about in terms of how to beef up what we're suggesting you know, agencies include when they're in their plans, et cetera, by using language, and I don't think Jonathan disagrees, of the basis for a new rulemaking. That is a legal administrative law determination. I talked to numerous agency folks who have differing views as to, you know, if it's used to target, is it the basis or not, et cetera. I don't know. I don't think we're giving, I don't think we're doing what we think we might be doing with that second sentence. So it might be more productive to take out something that will ring like uh, everyone knows that if something, any empirical information right before AI, the EPA is using very sophisticated logistical uh, regression methodology, et cetera. And there's sometimes where that's the basis for rulemaking and it's all disclosed and there's administrative law about that. So I think maybe we should just talk about like substantively what more we want agencies to do other than include information and move away from making it sound, you know, I'm just not sure what that's, you know, I understand, as I said, the spirit of what you're trying to do, but I would, I, I don't think it's a, it's the right way to go with that. James? 
Hi, I just want to uh, round out this discussion a little bit. I, don't, I think it's way beyond the scope of what can go into paragraph five, let alone the rest of the, um, the document. But I think there, it, we should bear in mind an important distinction between right-hand side and left-hand side uses of mathematical tools. And just this is really oversimplifying, but on the right-hand side or left-hand side, you're really looking for the predictions. You want the outcomes, you want the fitted values. On the right-hand side, you want the coefficients. You want the explanations or the in interpretations depending on, on your mathematical framework. So when we say, how does the tool advance this goal? Uh, I wonder if there's a way we can distinguish helpfully between predictions, forecasts, right? What we think the tool is going to tell us about the future on one hand versus contributions of any mathematical tool to coming up with the etiology or the, the reason something happened, coming up with an explanation. And it might be helpful um, to craft uh, even a split of, you know, just a little phrase that's connected by and or or in the middle that distinguishes between predictions and, and explanations. James, I can't tell if that suggestion is related to five or if you're suggesting that we need a new uh, recommendation I, that is- I'm indifferent to whether, I mean, five is long. Yeah. Um, and whether this is 5A and then it becomes six and you roll everything down. But I do think that there is a useful distinction um, between mathematical tools, algorithms, models, methods, whatever you want to call them, right? They, they're, they're slightly different. But there's a, there is a meaningful distinction between the predictions of a tool on one hand, on the left-hand side, and the explanations uh, or interpretations that the tool may generate on the right-hand side. Um, do, you, do you think I could ask you to um, take a stab at writing a sentence that sort of says- I can while we're talking. Uh, do you want me to, how am I going to do it besides putting it in the chat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. I was just thinking that. Um, can you think about it for a second and yeah, put it in the chat maybe? I'm going to accept that as a suggestion okay. in the chat. I'll lower my hand. Uh, stop yeah. talking with thank the. You, thank um, you. Just right. so that we can be looking at something specifically rather than just generally. And while he's working on that, um, Kathy, do you have a view on on whether the thing he's working on is part of five or not? It seems to me like it's maybe something different. But again, I am not an SME here. Uh, yeah, I'd have to see. You'd have to see it. Okay, great. Um, Jonathan, can I go back to you with the wordsmithing question on the on the suggestion in the third sentence here? Um, uh, do we really mean that agencies should explain how the tool contributed to the development of or how the tool contributed to the decision to develop the new rule? I feel like you mean the decision. I feel like we mean the decision based on our our conversation. Right, because the the stuff that we're talking about in this paragraph is only about identifying the rules. It's not, it's not kind of deciding what to do with them. It's not like the substance of the rules. So developing the new rule sounds like we're talking about the substance of what should be in the new rule. And I think I heard you really talking about we should just be disclosing that we relied in part on AI um, algorithmic tools to figure out that this would be something that we wanted to revisit. Does that? better capture what you meant or have I missed it? Um, that That's fine. And that, I think that um, your suggestion refers more to the use of the tool in the retrospective review. So how that spurred the new rulemaking, um, how it contributed to the decision to develop the new rule. Uh, that would be fine. And But I also want to go back to Kathy's comment earlier, if I understood that we should sort of discuss this more and separately. So maybe that means uh, this sentence should be separated out from number five into a separate paragraph so it can really be uh, uh, critiqued and uh, uh, okay, so put selected in or out. Or, or maybe Kathy was saying 
we should keep this out for now. And I would, do we have another committee meeting on this in April? We do have another committee meeting in April. Can, can I actually also put one other thing on the table? I was gonna ask the ACA staff about this, which is we do sometimes say consistent with blah, 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 you know, some doctrine or whatever, and then we do a citation. Is that, do we not do that? I mean, is there some rush, is there some reason to, and the reason why I'm thinking that I suppose is that on the implementation council, um, there's been a lot of discussion about who actually is the recipient of the recommendations and who are all the people that we need to be seeing as our audience in agencies. And I guess my personal response to Kathy's concern about this being like a basic principle of administrative law is that that not that may not be so basic and obvious to people who are not administrative lawyers, but who nonetheless are part of who we're targeting with these recommendations. So I guess that's my kind of reaction is that even if it is, uh, you know, kind of a core principle that we all get, that still may not mean that we shouldn't have it here. One, and then two, if we do have it here, Kathy, would you be more comfortable if there were some, of course, or as consistent with, or with some footnote? So Kathy. Yeah, so I find myself in the awkward situation of for something like this, I would cite a law review article that I wrote in Belmont, yeah. AI for Retrospective Review, pages 405 to 406, where I specifically talk about, you know, that uh, the APA's notice and comment mandate, you know, has been interpreted to require that agencies make publicly available critical information underlying proposed rules. And I argue that they, we should go further and in, especially in light of human in the loop gaining kind of talismanic significance, I wanted to say, even when it's in a support role, it should be disclosed. So it's a principle that I embrace. I just don't think it comes from the report that I conducted. So it, it, I, I think separating it out as a separate principle, yes. And then, you know, it's controversial how far, right? What's new about the, AI technology in this space is there are some people who draw bright line rules between supportive AI technology and determinative. And I'm of the view that there's not such a bright line and I'm all for subjecting to more disclosure and also notice and comment. But it's, um, but so at a minimum, I would separate it out. And then we should just know that we're entering, I know Jonathan knows, I know we're entering kind of a debate about how much further beyond just existing, you know, that statement basically just states kind of like an existing administrative law legal proposition, but what it means as applied, where AI technologies, where you cross the line, where has a technology been used only to, you know, spot or identify and where has it been used really to, um, you know, flag for overruling only by humans. Those are interesting things we could discuss. Jonathan, thank you, Kathy. Jonathan, do you have a view on hitting return and having your new sentence be a separate recommendation? Uh, sure, that's fine. And okay. I, I anticipate we will then discuss, you know, discuss it more in the next committee meeting before it goes to the yeah. plenary also. Okay, all right. So my thought here then is that it seems like we have nothing else to add on five as is because we were sort of moving beyond it. And then I think we've had a robust discussion of what is now six. And so my instinct would be just as Jonathan said to come back to it uh, in the second meeting. Um, do I hear any concerns with this plan, Sean? Very minor point, just that uh, I think it should be Instead of saying the basis, we should say a basis because there's frequently more than one basis yes. for rulemaking. Thank you. And and I agree with all the prior points that that this is completely consistent with the APA's requirements. It's also, um, you know, the need for the rulemaking is spelled out as being required in Executive Order twelve eight six six. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, Akis point, Kaja, and or Jeremy, we now have James's proposed sentence. Um, I don't, is there some sort of order of operations as between moving through the recommendations that were already here versus adding? Okay, 
if there isn't, Kaja, I see you shaking your head no. So then could you could I ask you to cut and paste James's sentence just just the you know just this thing in quotation marks as maybe recommendation new recommendation seven, I guess. So after the sentence that we just added. Okay, I think there's a typo in predictions, but but thank you for that. Um, so, uh, I guess let's let's talk about this substantively first, and then let's see if it fits here. If people want to go forward with it, so thank you, James, for crafting it. Can I hear some reactions to the substance of it? Does the lack of reactions means that it feels intuitively right? Kathy? Um, I, so could, could I just understand, maybe James, you could say some more about um, the purpose and the need. I mean, I, I just yeah. I, I went I, ahead I and tagged from some more explanation. You know, sure. I just went ahead and tagged in the chat uh, a couple of references. These are very standard, long, um, long-standing law review references: Finkelstein and Fisher. And the idea is, um, let's just use the example of a traditional linear regression, uh, multiple regression with, uh, let's say three or four different um, predictive variables, nothing, nothing elaborate. The predictive value of such a traditional regression model is to come up with fitted values, the y hat on the left-hand side of the equation. And the explanatory value uh, or interpretive value, um, sometimes you hear inferent, um, causal inference is a term used uh, in connection with these regression models. Causal inference or effect size um, would be inferred from the coefficients in front of each variable on the right-hand side. And it has been understood for half a century at least that there's a meaningful difference between these two uses of mathematical models in all lawmaking. Okay, so it is helpful to distinguish from, to, to explain up front, are you using a mathematical model to generate like a price forecast? We think that the price of tin or copper should be this, and if, if it's not, this is evidence of manipulation or price fixing or predatory pricing or something. But many uses in law aren't necessarily trying to find the prediction. It's trying to say, well, and a classic example is, uh, to what extent do we think that these differences in employment outcomes are attributable to sex discrimination, race discrimination, or some combination of the two? And that's where you would use the right-hand side, uh, the explanatory component. So I'm, I'm packing a lot. James, can I, can I ask a question? I'm trying to say, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Are you done? Can I ask my follow-up question? I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. Okay. Uh, following on um, that explanation, I'm wondering how that fits in. I understand all the examples you gave, but I'm wondering how that fits into the, this is a narrow recommendation of retrospective rulemaking. And so the examples you offer weren't about identifying rules for retrospective review. And I guess I'm wondering if the, if there are some applications in the particular con, this is not a you know this is not a general algorithmic tool recommendation. It's a really specific one. And if there are some examples on uh, retrospective review, 
could we consider having some parentheticals with examples for how on the predictive side and how on the interpretation or explanation? Sure. I mean, uh, you know, this is probably better directed to um, people who rem I, I may have been involved in. I just can't remember anything uh, in 2021-2. Um, but examples would be, as I said, if you have anything that purports to give this is what we thought a particular number would be, whether it's pollution, it's a job outcome, it's a price, right, on one hand, versus um, a factor affecting one of those out outcomes, such as we think that, um, you know, stationary versus non-stationary sources contributed this much. Right. So I am not hearing how those examples apply to the context of retrospective review, but perhaps I am missing something. Jonathan, okay. I, I know you were involved in 21.2, so I was going to call on you because James just said maybe other people who were involved in 2021.2 have some parallel here, but Kathy, I saw your hand first, so maybe I'll give Jonathan, not to cold call you, but I'll give you a chance to think, Jonathan, if you want to have anything to respond on this suggestion. But Kathy, I did see your hand, although now you put it back down. But do you want to? I'm happy to defer to Jonathan. I was just about to say that James's points are well taken. I, did, I have several degrees where I did lots of sophisticated multivariate regression analysis, but the specific technical details, I don't know, James, if you've seen, we have this appendix too that talks about the technical details of these AI-enabled tools, and it doesn't map onto that readily. So I, I would, um, you know, I think that coupled with uh, Eloise, what you said, it's less clear. I mean, that just gives a technical underpinning for what you said about how it's not exactly focused on the retrospective review. You know, you okay, I'll, I'll call. Thank you, Kathy. James, I'll call on you in one second, but let me just first see if Jonathan did want to weigh in as somebody who was involved in 21-2. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure that 2021-2 on periodic retrospective review spoke to this. Um, that was mainly a study of where agencies are um, instructed or guided by statute, executive order, or their own policies to uh, review their policies every so often, sometimes specific interval time periods, um, and whether they do or don't, and how they could do better. So we didn't really talk about the um, the analytic methodology of uh, like multiple regression analysis in that report. Um, that said, you know I think the points that James is making here are very well taken. Uh, maybe they go to it. It, it might have been a prior recommendation, or maybe it's a subsequent one about. Uh, it's about transparency in the um, use of machine learning, for example, we could say more generally algorithmic tools. And as James says in the chat, it goes back to regression analysis before AI. Um, so maybe it go, I guess it's not, it's not the open source code uh, paragraph, but do we have another paragraph about transparency in the uh, reporting the uh, what these algorithmic tools are are finding. Maybe that's where it goes, but. Okay, so let's, before we think about where to move it, I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding the nub of it. And I am the person who's gonna to have to explain at the plenary how this connects to the recommendation and I don't understand it. So I think I need, in order to put myself in the position of being able to explain to the council and the, and the conference, I need parentheticals that would say, uh, whenever agencies use algorithmic tools in retrospect to, to develop the, or to assess potential candidates for retrospective review or whatever the right phrase is, they should distinguish between the predictions of such tools, parens, such as comma, in this context, blah, 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 and any contributions by those tools to the interpretation or explanation of those predictions, parens, such as in this context, blah, blah, blah. Because otherwise, James, I really, really appreciate your effort to explain to me, not technically trained in this or in this field, all of the examples. And they do make really good sense to me as you're explaining them. But I don't see how any of them are connected to this recommendation. And so that's where I'm getting a little bit lost. So I'll call on you if, now, James. Yeah, if you may, if I, I went ahead and lowered my hand, thanks. The um I think 
we got misled a little bit. You wanted me to peg it to paragraph five. And the whole point of putting it outside paragraph five is I think this is a more general problem in all algorithmic tools. And as John, Jonathan says, this is going all the way back to pre-AI. This is foundational to all mathematical tools. I, I know you don't have, and, I, and so say white hat or coefficients may not help. But let me just give a very basic problem, which is like my, my bane of today, which is my dogs are barking crazily, okay? And so if I'm just trying to predict where they're gonna bark and for how long and how loudly, right? That is the result or the prediction of my, my little machine tool for, for figuring out what's gonna to happen to the dogs. Now, what I really wanna know in terms of managing dog behavior is the fact that it's either squirrels, other dogs, babies walking by, or it's the delivery truck, okay? And those are all contributors to the ultimate result, which is the probability of a dog bark, the intensity or decibel level of a dog bark, and how long it lasts. So, so we see a difference between the outcome of the dog bark and the cause of the dog, dog bark. And the outcome, sometimes machines are used to deliver outcomes. Sometimes machines are used to deliver explanations. Sometimes they're used to do both. But I think people, especially on the retail side, the sharp end of administrative agency action deserve to know whether the machine underneath it all is trying to tell you the outcome, the reason, or both. And I'm, tr and I'm trying to lay it as, as simply as I can. I get that, but it's not just paragraph five that's about retrospective review. The whole recommendation is only about retrospective review. So I guess in, that's- no, in, retrospe I, in retrospect, not, were you trying I'm, to- All right, so let me just, and, and, and look, here, let me just preface all this by saying, if this is not appropriate to this section or this recommendation, I am more than happy to punt and we can figure out some other way to work on this kind of thing on AI, this is not an issue that's going to go away. No one recommendation is going to exhaust ACUS's work on this. And we'll do it tomorrow in a future, in a future, um, future recommendation. All I'm suggesting that even if you're looking retrospectively, the accuracy of the predictions that were generated is a distinct idea that needs to be evaluated apart from the inputs into your decision-making process. And I think that's foundational to all of law. It just so happens that once you introduce a machine into the room, that there is now a mathematical framework for explaining it. And then we have to work hard and, and translate that the logic of math into human normal natural language. Okay. Okay. And 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 look, if I'm not taking this personally. If you, yeah, if you think it's yeah. not appropriate for this one, just say so and we'll and we'll save well, it for another time. Well, let me thank you so much for that further explanation, James. That's really helpful. Kathy, let me ask you to weigh in on this here. Is this something that you think we should have in this is this kind of thing taking its value in general, you know, as your input before, is this the kind of recommendation that we should have in this particular project, or does this seem like a more general point that belongs better in a different project? Yeah, I mean, with respect, James, my inclination is that it would be belong in a different project. And it would, it's, you know, I, I fully agree that um, many people do not understand the difference between you know, making predictions, especially based on pattern recognition technology and making causal inferences. And I've done some of my own work about work, for example, that the FDA is doing is decision-making where misunderstanding that is really critical as to understanding the output. I don't think it um, has the kind of resonance for these particular uses with regard to retrospective review. So thank you for that, Kathy. So my inclination is to ask Kaja, could you please cut and paste James's very helpful sentence into some ACUS ether where it cannot be lost for some future project for which it would be relevant? 
and I'll just sort of, yeah, I see a thumbs up and James's observation is of course completely right that this is not an issue that's going away. And so we don't wanna lose this. We don't wanna lose this thought even if even if the sort of sense of the, of the Zoom room is maybe that it belongs in a different recommendation rather than this one. So, okay, so thank you Kaja for, for keeping that. Okay, so I think that leads us to be at line 75 with um, agencies should maintain their regulations in a format that facilitates the effective use of algorithmic tools and retrospective review, for example, by including relevant metadata. So do we have some views or suggestions on this recommendation? Okay, I'm hearing none. Shall we move to line 77 with recommendation eight? Although I'm meaningfully pausing just to do a double check that no one wants to weigh in on seven. But okay, I'll put, I'll think, uh, did somebody just raise a hand? Sean, your camera just came on. Did you, is that like indicative of something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm a little confused. Uh, so, so are we talking about um, may, the the current number seven agency should maintain the regulations in a format? That is what I had put on the table. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I'm a little like generally the, the regulations are maintained by the by the Code of Federal Regulations. That's available online. It's pretty easy for tools to scrape the information there. Um, we don't. We sometimes put out compliance guides that summarize regulations, uh, but we don't tend to reprint our regulations or provide them on the web. Uh, we rather just point to the ECFR. So is the suggestion that, does the CFR, does the ECFR not already do this then? I think that, yeah, I think ECFR is where you would go to analyze. Yeah, but I mean, so if the question is who, to whom should this record, I guess my question is, is this recommendation therefore unnecessary? Or is the suggestion that the recommendation should be who oversees the ECFR? The yeah, GFR? I'd love to hear from Kathy on, on what, yeah. what, yeah. what yeah. you guys are looking I, for. I mean, we can hear from Kaja and Jeremy, but I took this to be coming from the recommendation, the report around page 50. And actually, Sean, it referred to two aspects that actually agencies should consider more as a more structured form to their rulemaking. So DOT existing has a more structured form to its rules, which we discussed before obviated the need for certain sort of sophisticated natural language processing tools to take from an unstructured form and structure it. And then the metadata point came from CMS talked about in their existing repository of regulations to be able to add important features that are sort of agency specific to that. So I agree with you the way this is phrased. I'm not sure it's not really about maintaining. It's I think it's it should be about should consider um, uh, they can should consider a more structured format for their rulemaking, and then um, uh, for their rules. Yeah, not their rulemaking, right? For their yeah. Yeah. So, so to me, I guess that's more about the readability of the regulations. Um, when I looked at the this this recommendation, I, th I thought we were talking about who maintains like the yeah. Yeah. how to present the data. Okay, so is the, continuing with my interest in wordsmithing, are we suggesting that this now say agencies should consider drafting their regulations in a more structured format that facilitates? I mean, I wouldn't want to write for AI or algorithms. I would want to write for people and then hope yeah. that AI and algorithms like people are able to interpret our regulations well and easily. Yeah, yeah. And I also want to make sure, I mean, we have all these ACUS recommendations about plain English. So um, Kaja or Jeremy, do you have a view on how to capture those two, I don't want to call them conflicting, but those two uh, valuable lines of thought? Yeah, you're talking about this considered drafting. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I'll speak for at least from, and Jeremy might have something to add, but from my personal interpretation, I think I didn't really understand what structured format would mean. And I think Sean's point was well taken that to me, at least it, that had to do with readability. And I don't associate me, like metadata with readability. I, I associate that with like searchability of recommendation or um, of rules by algorithmic tools. So I think that was our intention okay. behind the phrasing of this. Um, but if if Kathy's clarity, if, if Kathy can provide clarity on what was meant by that, like she did, that that might change the wording of it like so. Okay, Jeremy, do you want to weigh in also as a drafter? No, I think that's correct. This was only intended to translate the recommendation report. for okay. the report. Okay. All right. So can we, so Kathy or Sean, can can one of you kind of following up on the points you just made suggested via language in line 75 through 77? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking this, I agree with Sean that it's like, you don't wanna, you're not doing this to facilitate AI, it's a good practice. And it turns out that it therefore obviates the need for sophisticated natural language tools to structure the rulemaking. So, no, but does that mean that you would suggest deleting this or that? I think you know, it's a good recommendation. I think that they should consider um, drafting regulations in a in a more structured format. Um, I'd have to think about that, you know, there are, um, uh, I guess there are two separate points. So one point was the DOT example is their structured format obviated the need for one stage of the algorithmic enabled tooling. And then there's the separate issue about the relevant metadata, which can be very helpful for leveraging the tools, which really comes and out. In part, we don't want the, for example, in part, we want a hard return. And then we want, in addition, agencies should include relevant meta metadata. Yeah, and that would be for more, I mean, you would want to do that again, that comes out of like the CMS recommendations, they have an existing body, meta regs, and they talked about how it can't really leverage AI capabilities, because it doesn't have a knowledge graph structure, metadata features that could enable those capabilities. So it's kind of like the first point, if you structure your rulemaking, uh, you don't need to do a complicated process of having NL structure your rulemaking. And the second is, if you're going to take advantage of these AI enabled tools, you need to think about your existing repository of regulations and consider adding relevant metadata. Okay, Kaja? Yeah, I think I'm just confused as to what, how, what the bridges between structured format and how that improves an algorithm's efficiency. Like reorganizing something in a different way to me does not make an algorithm more or less likely to interpret something, whereas metadata makes it more likely that it will incorporate it into a search result, for example. So I, I'm having trouble just kind of bridging the gap here. Um, I think we're agreeing there are two separate points. The structured rulemaking is like the DOT example. Why didn't they have to use as some other agencies have, like let's take DOD and Game Changer that has mountains of policy documents that are internally inconsistent, conflicting, et cetera. Like if those were a very structured format, it would just obviate the need, not for entirely using these tools, but it would obviate the need to use natural language processing tools to map topics, subtopics using clustering algorithms. So right? how- you know, wondering why we would need a recommendation on structured format then. Well, because it's all about, it's sort of about if our overarching goal, right, is to enable agencies to do retrospective review in the most efficient, cost-effective, uh, and um, robust manner, there are different paths towards that. And so some agent, you know, it, they're different models of how, and the less sort of structured your rulemaking is, the more you're going to have to think about taking 
this whole repository and using tools to organize it. Or to say too, it's not like agencies are gonna become something else. CMS talked to us at length in some of the interviews about how some of what the pilot showed to them was actually more about how in the future when they go about their rulemakings, they should follow a more structured format, just seeing, you know, so it's, it is related, but I agree with you. Those are two separate points. The so how making in the metadata. How about something like uh, when agencies draft regulations, they should be aware that more structured blah, blah, blah may enhance subsequent efforts to use algorithmic tools in retrospective rulemaking, period. Does that capture what you're saying? Because is your hand still up? Oh, or no, it's not, but I might need you Jer to- Jeremy that. just put his hand up, Jeremy. Yeah, I just for clarity, because I imagine this will come up by the council or by the assembly. What does it mean to promulgate rules in a structured format? I mean, obviously rules take a certain, rules look a certain way. We all know what the CFR looks like, but what do you mean about structuring rules in a particular format? I, I, I'm not sure it's clear here what it means to have rules in a structured Kathy, format. What yeah, I mean, I, it gets into, so it gets a little bit into the weeds, right? The the up the upshot of the report shows two very different approaches. So the GSA CMS pilot was using this KRR, where they're basically trying to encode the regulations such that there's one explicit interpretation of regulations. They're, so they're making regulations into a very explicit structured form that have actors and duties and consequences, et cetera. The other kinds of way of thinking about it is you take whatever exists in this totally unstructured format and try to use technology like NLP to structure it. And then on top of that, you're going to do your analytic analysis. So really, it's just, I don't know if it's about, maybe it's just more that agencies should be aware that the effectiveness or ability of um I, I don't know. I have to think about because it's more there's an interrelationship between the types of technologies that are that you're going to need and this. And there's a way in which um, what you could do, just to get back to your basic question, DOT rules, if you read them, are much more structured. But do you mean so, like with A, B, C, little yeah. I, little B, little, little yeah, I like mean, what's the topic? What are so if in other agencies, like read the, you know, the report about DOT game changer is about trying to figure out ways from multiple sub agencies who each have promulgated multiple guidances, which ones affect which parties. That's very difficult to figure out without the use of the game changer technology. But if the rules were structured in a way that it's very clear, anytime you're promulgating a rule that affects this entity, you know, this it's it's done in that topical way, you then don't have to use like these kinds of um techniques to do that at the in the beginning. So hold on. But so then you're just saying that the more you're not talking about A, B, C, you're talking about more clearly, the clearer the rules apply to certain entities or topics, the easier it will be for... Yeah, let's just step back, right? Retrospective review, part of what we're talking about in this whole thing is use of technology to identify overlapping redundancies, et cetera. So the way your raw material, where you start, is going to determine uh, how much effort and how much technology you need to get to that end point. What is it, can we think of a synonym for more structured? Is it clear clarity or like what's a, can you define, can you come up with a synonym for more structured? Because I mean, what we're really saying is agencies should be aware when they are drafting regulations that drafting regulations that do blah will facilitate subsequent, will facilitate the subsequent ability of algorithmic tools to locate it in for potential retrospective rulemaking. But I think, but I, I mean, like I'm hearing some questions about 
defining structure, not with reference to the report and not with reference to like seven sentences, but just sort of a, a definitional synonym. Um, so Kathy, I was asking you if you had a synonym, do you have a synonym? I mean, I see James's hand went up also. I'm happy to call on him if you prefer. Um, I don't have a synonym, but I agree with the spirit, the way that you just. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. The point is. So it's to remind, point. right. Or could I call it? So Cade, can yeah. I recognize Cade, my RA? Cade yes, please. Let's call on Cade, but then James, I'm going to go back to you. Hi. Um, yeah. So I think that the point this is is getting at is that you need to be able to encode the regulation in a machine readable format so a machine can do some sort of logical steps formal formal logic propositions on it so the example that we use in the report a lot was this format in krr called eflint uh which effectively means that a, an agency is going to take its regulation and it's going to encode it into some this one structured format that says something like this regulated entity has a duty X and this other entity has a duty Y, like a collection of agency duty is this thing. So when we say structured format, the point that we're, we're trying to make is just think about the way that a machine is going to understand this when you apply the regulation, when, when you interpret the regulation in a way that is machine readable. Machines are not good with formal text. So how about, so I'll call on you a second, thank you, Cade, I'll call on you a second, James, but how about something like when agencies draft their regulations, they should consider how uh, algorithmic, they, can, they should consider the ease with which algorithmic tools may be able to identify issues that they may subsequently wish to capture in retrospective review. I mean, I'm like going for a little bit of a higher level of generality here uh, because I, what I heard from Cade was a little bit kind of like broader than the, it was kind of like, just think downstream about how you may wanna be involving um, algorithmic tools here. So let's just, uh, you guys can put your hands back up again in, in a second if you want to, but James, you were patient uh, when I called on other people. So James, let's just see if you wanna add Something. I do. I actually have some language I put into the chat. Sorry about that. The okay. use it, but I think it's the only way to get language. Yeah, and I called on you, so it's fine. Yes. Okay. So, so uh, I suggest, and, and Kate, I assume you have a, uh, you speak uh, very, very literally with uh, about uh, specific computer technology. So I, this is with the backdrop of saying structured and unstructured, as Kathy recognized, has a very particular um, term of art feel inside data science and computer science. And I'm trying to reduce this to a phrase that is ACUS friendly Thank you. and still digestible by uh, people without computer science degrees. I think digitized and vectorized have meaning, especially in nat natural language processing. But the biggest, most general definition is to say it's machine readable. Okay, whether it's been optically converted, I mean, there are any number of different ways of doing this, but if it is not machine readable format, that's just this en enormously difficult thing that just makes the process work a lot harder. And I think if you, if all we're trying to communicate here is data that's in a format that machines can easily extract or harvest or scrape is different from data that is utterly unstructured and has to be whipped into shape before people can do their magic. And I hope that this short phrase captures what Cade uh, has explained and what um, I think Kathy ultimately intends. So Jeremy. I just wanna make sure that it's clear to a lay agency official reading this that they sort of know how to actually implement this recommendation. By the very reason of being published in the Federal Register, aren't regulations already machine readable, available in XML format? Is there something else that we're asking agencies to do to structure their data to facilitate retrospective review on top of 
the mere act of publication in the Federal Register? Jeremy, I'm happy to recognize whoever you were asking that question to. Who are you asking that question to? Jane? I guess the room. I, I, I wish we had our FR person here. But um, as I understand it, the FR, I mean, it's certainly machine readable. As okay. All right. So let's have that question floating out there. I, I want to observe that we still don't know, like we have a phrase now from James, we don't have a thing that we're embedding the phrase in the sentence of, right? I was going up to this higher level of generality, just like the, when you're drafting, think about retrospective review and algorithmic tools later. So that's the kind of spirit that we're heading towards, um, but we're still working on the work on the, on the bringing it together. So um, Dave, I'll recognize you. Thanks. Um, I, I've been lurking here for this conversation and I keep coming back to whether or not we're getting way too far ahead of our skis for the level of expertise that anyone that reads this recommendation is, is going to be at. Um, it does not seem to be well within the wheelhouse of a rule writer to be able to forecast the needs of future algorithmic tools. Um, we have a system uh, right now uh, where the, the Office of the Federal Register uh, does a, a pretty good job of, of trying to figure out where the next step is going to be. I, I, 20 years ago, I was on T-Rex, which was you know building an XML platform for uh, uh, the Federal Register and the CFR. We're constantly through this. And, and my, my, I wonder whether what we really want to say is that the government as a whole in its representatives in, you know, in, in GPO and, and OFR uh, really should just keep their eyes on where this, where this goes and keep, keep, um, operating a system that is cognizant of, of the available technologies. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, I, I don't know that we could even advise any rule writers of what they could or should know in order to follow this recommendation. And anything that they, anything that they as a layperson would do in a rule today would be obsolete by the time the rule was final. So I, I just, I, I'm actually questioning the need for the recommendation at all. Okay, thank you for that, Dave. Um, Kathy, do you have a response? Um, we could, I don't feel strongly that we need to have this recommendation. I, I disagree with the, so I didn't take the point, although I see how it was written. I'd missed this before maintaining regulations. The C, this is not about that the CFR, you know, let's put it this way. I'll be very specific. Reg Explorer, Deloitte begins by scraping the CFR. That's the beginning point. And then it develops all sorts of different functionalities that are AI enabled, many of which are um, very difficult to do because regulations have never been designed thinking clearly about how AI assistive technology could help this labor intensive human process. Maybe they should have, and some agencies have done that. So that's the, so, so if we don't want to get beyond, you know, it was an interesting, um, it was an interesting discovery to see, just to come back again to this specific example, to see how the, and I can't think of a good cinnamon, the structured nature of DOT's rulemaking allowed them to use something like the reg data dashboard that another agency could not just copy. Uh, so it's just a different path. And then Cave's point is more about the road not taken. Right now, what most agencies, DOD, um, 
and um, HHS, what most agencies that are using AI-enabled technologies are using natural language processing to come up with very sophisticated ways from unstructured text to figure out what their topics are, et cetera. The GSA pilot was designed to look at a different way. And that's what Cade was talking about, about whether you could actually encode all of the regulations using the eFlint technology. And they did that with a small subset of CMS regulations. So we probably want to maintain, all of this is to say, we probably want to be agnostic. We're not choosing which road should be taken. So I'd, I think I'd sooner take this recommendation out than try to parse it to make some kind of affirmative recommendation to agencies now that I understand what the drafters thought they were doing. Okay, that's helpful. Dave, do you want to respond to that point? But yeah, I, it, it sounds like there is a role for someone to be putting together the information for agencies to choose among these strategies. Um, since there are some very interesting strategies that you know, you've described. I don't know at this point uh, who that would be uh, or how that would be a, uh, a work product. Um, and I don't know if, if asking someone to develop those best practices for communications to agency rule writers is within the scope of the project, but it sounds like that's something to discuss. Thanks, Dave. So I'm going to just note that we have a recommendation to OMB and a recommendation to GSA coming up below, which, you know, we're not going to have time to really discuss those now, but Kathy, is, is either of those entities an entity to do the kind of, hey, agencies, when you're drafting, just think about this downstream stuff? kind of along the lines of what Dave was suggesting in terms of best practices, is that something that one of these entities could be uh, recommended to do? Or is there some other entity you could think of? Or is this is this not, where are you again back in the land of you prefer to just cut it out? Dave, do you want to make a correction to what I just said, the way I framed it before we get Kathy's? No, <laughs> no not, not to correct, but to provide some input on that. Um, the, the recommendation with regard to OMB is directed at two different offices within OMB. So OFPP would be issuing acquisition guidance, which I was actually going to say I don't know is necessary, uh, given that that FAR is pretty complex in of itself, and it is a contracting exercise. Uh, OIRA, perhaps on the use of algorithmic tools, but uh, the group over at GSA would seem to be the place to have that kind of uh, more detailed uh, uh, technology-based discussion about uh, the options available to agencies in terms of tools uh, and techniques uh, rather than a, or necessarily a wire. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Um, Kathy, is that is that a view that you share or do you have some other reaction? to the kind of broader question I put on the table about who's the right entity to be have this directed to. Um, you know, I, I think that if we wanted to keep something for purposes of discussion, I'm not sure it falls into any of the entities. I think it would be a more general point of agencies that are considering the use of AI enabled technology. So it would be both natural language processing ones and these KRRs, um, you know, should consider how the structure, and I, I keep, I'm sorry about structure, should consider how their, and should consider structuring their rules that would be conducive for the use of those tools. But I also take the point that we don't really want to be recommending to agencies that they draft rules for machines. But I do think that it was a very strong point that surfaced throughout that if agencies are inclined because they identify a problem in retrospective review specifically of how 
human intensive, labor intensive it is, and they want to use these tools, it behooves them to give some thought to this, namely the way in which they write their rules is going to impact the interface with these technologies. But that, you know, maybe that's either too obvious, although it came up a lot. I, I don't think it really goes to another entity necessarily. Like, so is this then something like agencies, when agencies learn from the use of algorithmic tools about some thing that generates, I, I, you know, when agencies learn in blah, 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 they should extrapolate what lessons they may learn from that for their forward-looking rule writing. I mean, like, is that the most general point? And then perhaps there could be a second sentence that captures some of the I'm not even really sure what this would be in the second sentence because I think we've we've now moved beyond metadata and machine readable format. And I know you keep going to structure, but I keep hearing the same sort of concerns about structure. So I'm wondering if we want to leave it to use your word before agnostic as to what the lessons are or whether that's too general. When agencies learn from you know, I don't know, when agencies use algorithmic tools to identify candidates for retrospective review, comma, they should consider whether there are lessons they can draw from the use of the algorithm that might inform their forward-looking rule writing period. Mm-hmm. Okay, is there any, does anybody want to weigh in on that sentence? I like it better than what it replaces. <laughs> okay, so I think my inclination then is to, del- I mean, I'm like looking to see if people want to raise their hands and weigh in on this. And I don't, I don't see any as I am looking around, but please know I am specifically welcoming, <laughs> welcoming your thoughts here. But I guess my instinct would be at this point that we delete then the sentence that has all the red that we've been working on. I'm sorry, the, the, you know, when agencies should draft, maintain their regulations, they should. Let's sort of consider deleting that sentence and then sticking with the more general sentence that I just proposed. Um, And I guess my only slight concern is if we are not with with this more general sentence is whether we are missing a for example. And I, I hesitate to say that because I know we just got into a whole sticky thing about like, what do we mean by metadata? What do we mean by structure? What do we mean by machine readable? Um, so I don't really know what to propose there, but I'm just uh, observing you know, maybe I mean, would a sentence that used all those three things be out of line? For example, candidates might be. Ensuring that rules contain relevant metadata, comma, ensuring that rules are written in a structure that avoids the need for natural language processing, blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is not my area at all. So I am merely parroting back nouns that you all have been using, comma, and that um, there was one more word, I think from, yeah, from James, we were with the machine readable. I don't know if this adds anything or if it just complicates the matter. Kathy, do you have a view? Or I can call him James if you don't, but Kathy, yeah. Yeah, no, I was just I was just catching up there. Um yeah, and I mean there are specific examples 
you know, CMS is considering. I know, but we can't give specific. No, no, no. I'm, no, no. Yeah. I'm saying it gives me my authority. I'm not saying to add that. I'm saying there is support for that in the. Yeah. Room. Okay. That's yeah. Yeah. Okay. So James, if you can kind of offer a comment in about one sentence or one minute, that would be helpful. There's a longstanding ACUS tradition of the plenary wide committee on style. There could be a committee level committee, subcommittee on style, where in principle, you want to give some examples. And I think um, the drafters, uh, and Kathy in particular, should have the first crack at coming up with three or four generalized examples, yeah. getting into the weeds of XML. Okay. So this does not sound like committee on style for me, but it does sound very much like we could ask Jeremy and Kaja and Kathy between now and the next committee meeting, whether we want to give a couple of specific examples in a second, in the second sentence. And if in fact we do, what those examples would be that are generally understandable. But I don't, it's not committee of style yet because it's still specific. It, it's a committee, it's a committee yeah, of, the, I, of the drafters. Yeah, yeah. I take I take your point with that. Okay. okay so this has been super productive. And I want to thank you all for all of the contributions over the course of the last several hours. So I my understanding, and I'm just going to pull up the right sheet that I have it on is that our second meeting is on Wednesday, April 12th from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. And so I think the goal would be to sort of quickly get through what we just did and then consider the new language that we're asking the ACUS team to propose, wrap up the final recommendations, and then go to the preamble along with the title. And we'll see where we are if we need to have a third meeting. I know that's always sort of part of what's in the committee's purview if that is in fact required. Though obviously, ideally, it's uh, it's great if we could wrap this up in the second meeting. So. Um, Kaja or Jeremy, is there anything I'm forgetting? I'm forgetting to add in this final farewell. No. No. Okay. Great. Well, then let me just end by thanking everybody who's here, thanking Kathy, thanking the ACUS team, and thanking all of you for your great participation. Uh, we all really appreciate it, and we'll see you uh, for the second meeting on April 12th. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Eloise.